about uh, we are now clearly finding very deficient. Saying he is very upset by what he saw, District 11 Councilmember Bill Rosendahl asked for an explanation from Police Chief Bratton as to what broke down. I appreciate you all coming here, but I'm very upset, frankly, in part, by what I saw and what I didn't see. Chief, you said it was a command and control breakdown. Explain what broke down. Well, quite le clearly, the leadership involved at that event, the ranking leadership in the department, uh, either did not give appropriate instructions, or the instructions they gave were not clear to those that were receiving them, and at various times during this event, did not take action that would have been appropriate. And let me be very specific. Chief Carter, for 19 minutes, marched with that Metro platoon, actually the three Metro platoons, across that field. On 11 different occasions, he could have stopped it. To the best of our ability and based on uh, uh, our understanding, he did nothing. He did not what? He did nothing. He did nothing. He went along for the ride. So that's a command and control breakdown from my perspective when I have a two-star chief of police who is the senior person on the scene in charge of 600 police officers who marches behind 100 officers using less lethal weaponry and ammunition, moving a group of agitators into a larger crowd of 4,000 people. I think I have a right to expect more of my leadership team than that uh, uh, lack of action, if you will. Additionally, I had a commander at the other end of the park who gave the order, based on at least our initial investigation, authorizing less lethal force, who also did nothing as the Metro unit moved into the area of the park that he was actually standing in. And as the thousands of people fled that park, they had to run by him. Right. He also did nothing. So when I talk about a command and control failure, the two senior ranking members who between them had over 70 years of experience in this department and they did nothing, well, Basically, the action I took against them within 24 hours, I think, speaks to my state of mind relative to my lack of confidence in their ability to continue commanding in this department. Besides resigning them to somewhere else, is there any other action you can take against them? We will, be we will be continuing to evaluate in terms of what action. Uh, uh, Chief Carter has indicated his intention to retire from the department. Commander Gray is currently reporting directly to the Chief of Operations, and as this case goes forward, we will make determinations as to what uh, actions may need to be taken against him. Because I just hope retirement isn't the only thing this officer can do. I mean, the rank and file need to know if an officer doesn't do his job, a command officer doesn't do his job, he doesn't get a chance to retire, he gets a chance to, to put himself in a situation where maybe there's some action that can be taken against him. Have you thought about any of those? Nothing I can do to prevent him from retiring if that's his option, sir. And what I would suggest is the action I took against these two ranking members of the department is probably the most significant action that's been taken in years in this department against ranking members. You may recall that at the beginning, the cops were already saying, oh, sure, it's going to be the same old story. We're going to take the brunt of the heat and the higher-ups, nothing's going to happen. Right. I would also point out that I report to a civilian police commission and I'll Ultimately, I will be held accountable by that commission based on my response as well as uh, my actions uh, involving this incident. No, and that's might, something that I, I fully accept. I might say, Chief, when we met with you shortly thereafter with the mayor and everybody else, you were very open and very clear, um, and, and you were not defensive. You were, you were not uh, you know, trying to protect anybody. You were like us wondering what went down and, and what needs to be done. So I appreciate your, your, your attitude, the way you project it. How many officers have we identified that have used either the shooting gun or the baton or something where they might have stepped over the line? Have we identified a number of them? The internal affairs investigation is proceeding with that, attempting, as I've indicated, the three levels those in which we have a complaint against a specific officer, in which an officer can be identified by badge or a helmet number, to the uh, issue of video that might then be matched up with that complaint, three, video that we have in which we don't have a complainant, in which we take an initial action. In that instance, there was a video that was shown there of a uh, what appears to be a young man uh, signed by three officers, two of whom strike him with their uh, batons. Uh, those three officers have been, the term we use is benched, pending the further investigation. But um, under the department protocols, 
That's the internal affairs investigation that will move uh, thoroughly, but we at this particular point in time have not interviewed all the complainants. Many complainants are not being made available to us by their attorneys. So in terms of doing a full investigation, both protecting the officer's rights under their, their constitutional rights and the police officer bill of rights, there's certain limitations and protocols to what we can do. And I would encourage the attorneys in these matters that uh, if you have an individual who claims to have been injured by the Los Angeles Police Department, make them available to us, or to the Inspector General. Many of them are waiting until they file their lawsuits, and then we'll have to pull that information out in depositions. Laying out her concerns about the incident on May 1st, Councilmember Janice Hahn asks if the orders that were given were wrong, or the way the orders were carried out was wrong. To that. And I guess what I'm trying to get from all this was, was it the order that was wrong? Was, was any of those orders wrong to, to shoot with less lethal weapon, to disperse the crowd, uh, you know, to move, to clear the park? Were those orders wrong or was, was it wrong in how it was carried out? By, by the rank and file officers who were carrying it out. Were, were, were they doing what they were told to do? Or were even some of them, as we've heard, maybe crossing the line in, in how they uh, took their office? So I'm trying to kind of figure out what was wrong. Was it the order? Would you, if you had to do it again, would you still give the order to disperse? Would you still give the order to begin shooting those less lethal weapons? Um, and is it ever appropriate to, to shoot I mean, there were some images of, you know, in the back. You know, one guy had one of those rubber bullets in his back. I mean, is that ever uh, appropriate to shoot uh, someone in the back, no matter how far away they I mean, it looked like an order was given to disperse, and it was very difficult to leave quickly enough to not be within that range of however many feet that it seems uh, allowable to, uh, to shoot the, the less lethal weapons. Um, and um, I guess that's what I want to know. What, what was wrong? Was it the order? Or, and maybe, and the other thing is, certainly the agitators were talked about, you probably talked about that before the event. Uh, those were agitators that we know kind of show up at those events. We're aware of them. But what became the difference between, uh, and there was one comment uh, on the video about, this is a different crowd here than what we had before. So what becomes different from, I think we're all kind of sympathetic to this feeling against those agitators, but what transpires between knowing if the agitators Agitators, the guys with the bandanas, guys throwing, till we're in the park now and we've got mothers with strollers and we've got news media. And, and how is their um, training to differentiate between, you know, those agitators that were all, they all, that those looked really scary to me too. Uh, and then what we saw in the park uh, being pushed and shoved and, and beaten and, and shot out. What, what training? helps with that. So those are just some of the concerns I have. Commander Gray, um, was it the order that was wrong or was it how it was implemented? And then uh, how do we differentiate out there on the field uh, between uh, the agitators and, and between what really looked like innocent people in the park? Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Hahn. Uh, Earl Paysinger. Um, uh, like the chief and, and my colleagues at the table and all of us in this room, um, we're, we're just extremely troubled. And to this day, uh, having not yet interviewed all the individuals who were a part of this uh, particular episode, um, we're still grappling for answers. Um, it's not anything that's, that's, um, that really escapes us in terms of the depth of, of how it affected the city, like Councilmember Hahn, I'm sorry, Councilmember Labange mentioned, but um, we, we're efforting to get there. Today was the first uh, throws of really outlining some of the issues that, we, we, that confronted us that day. Uh, and my great hope and expectation, as the Chief mentioned, is that we, we come to grips with um, not only the, the, the sins of um, commission with the sense of omission as well, not giving the proper leadership and guidance and direction uh, from the top down, uh, all of us in included. But to the specific point of your question as it relates to training, um, we have embarked upon a, a very diligent effort to um, provide the kind of in-depth um, training to our, our very new command team that we think will um, really give them the ability to, to feel and understand not only the tactical dimensions of some of the challenges that we deal with, but those that, that um, exist in that, in that framework of humanity. With the threat of losing a quorum, that's the number of council members needed to conduct city business, the council stopped 
stopped the floor debate and heard public comment on the matter. A motion to continue the item was considered and passed on a vote of 9 to 3. The Los Angeles Police Department and Board of Police Commissioners report on the events occurring at MacArthur Park will be continued until Wednesday, June 6th. You can listen to city council meetings as well as committee and commission meetings on the telephone by using the city's council phone system. In the downtown area, dial 213-621-CITY. In West L.A., dial 310-471-CITY. For the San Pedro area, dial 310-547-CITY. And in the San Fernando Valley, dial 818-904-9450. Just follow the recorded instructions for the meetings you want to hear. Watch Council Week in Review for highlights of the week's council meetings and listen for item numbers associated with those discussions you have an interest in. Then go to the World Wide Web and listen to them in their entirety using the new City of Los Angeles video on-demand feature. Visit the city's website at lacity.org and follow the instructions on the screen. And remember, you can watch all Los Angeles City Council meetings live in their entirety on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays beginning at 10 a.m. On Sundays, you can watch the replay of all the week's meetings, also beginning at 10 a.m. Well, that concludes our program for the week ending June 1st, 2007. On behalf of Monty Duarte and everyone here at Channel 35, I'm Jack Pope Joy. Thank you for watching, and please join us for the next Council Week in Review. In the city of Los Angeles, when duty calls, the LAPD responds. Hey, John, lower the gun, buddy. John, leave the gun. Working as a team. Go ahead and put the gun down. John, nobody's going to come at you, all right? But I'd feel a whole lot better if you were to lower that gun. To protect and to serve. Why don't you come back here to me, all right? All right, that's good. Walk toward me with your hands up, John. Put your hands up. All units go for the six. Thanks for working with me. K-9 10, show me code 6 on the article search for the Amber Alert. To fight crime and to keep our streets safe. Another positive hit on this bag. We believe at this time that the vehicle is in our custody. Any available unit to respond to the northeast corner, 7th and Gordon from the Amber Alert. 6K, 250, right? 14 next to the show's responding. Check out your way around. This is it. Let's go. For the officers of the LAPD, it's all in a day's work. Protecting our families. Look at your daddy. They take pride in what they do. Call from the Amber Alert. Missing child found and returned to parent. Suspect in custody. LAPD is hiring. Become a part of the team. Visit us at joinlapd.com. LA City View, Channel 35.
Council meeting for Friday, June 8th, 2007. We are here in the John Ferrara Memorial Council Chambers in room 340 of City Hall. We meet here every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m., except for the first Friday of the month in which we uh, take the meeting out to Van Nuys at the Van Nuys City Hall in our efforts to bring City Council closer to all Angelinos. We are also um, broadcast live through the city's uh, homepage at lacity.org. We have live streaming video webcasts of our council meetings. And uh, finally, you can always pull down old uh, council meetings and watch them on the web as well. We now have video on demand, which you can click on uh, previous meetings and previous items and watch it at your leisure. Broadcast live on Channel 35 and rebroadcast in the evening. Um, we also are available via telephone. If you call through the city's council phone service, uh, you can listen to the proceedings of the city council. That number is 213-621-CITY. Um, I want to thank members of the City Council who are here, pursuant to Council rules on time. Council members Cardenas, Gruel, Labange, Reyes, Wesson, and Zein. Uh, with myself, that makes uh, seven members, and we are awaiting Council members Alarcon, Hahn, Council member Parks, Council member Rosendahl, and Council member Weiss. Council members Smith and Wiesar are excused today, and Council member Perry is excused to arrive at 11 o'clock. Uh, until then, we will be proceeding with our honoring of uh, members of the community who join us here each uh, uh, Friday for special presentations. And uh, we have a number of presentations that we will begin shortly. So hang tight. and council member uh, Weiss. Uh, they could please make their way down to the council chambers. I'd like to uh, introduce our president of city council, Eric Garcetti, for a presentation. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you, uh, Madam President. It's my pleasure to join here with council member Reyes, and I know uh, council member Wiesar would be here in, in, uh, <clears throat> in person, but he certainly is here in spirit. Um, He's inaugurating, as I mentioned, a new flight from uh, Ontario Airport to Zacatecas, where he was born. Um, but he certainly uh, joins with Councilmember Reyes and myself, all three of us representing areas of Los Angeles, um, which are central core areas to the Filipino-American community. Um, and we join together to celebrate today the 109th anniversary of Philippine independence. Um, Los Angeles is the home to the largest number of Filipinos living outside the Philippines, anywhere in the world. And the Filipino-American community is much older than 109 years. In fact, two of the original pobladores who set out from Baja, California to start our city uh, were mistakenly called chinos by the Spaniards. They were actually Filipino, uh, like everybody who settled Los Angeles, Spanish subjects, but um, two Filipinos who came and were a part of our founding history. Since then, uh, Filipino Americans have been an integral part of Los Angeles. Uh, we recognize them as uh, critical to the strength of the city's cultural, social, economic, um, and political fabric. Um, we are very proud in this council to, in 2002, designated the first historic Filipino town anywhere in the United States of America, uh, bounded on the east by Glendale Boulevard, the north 101, Hoover Street, and Beverly Boulevard, uh, near where both Councilmember Reyes and I represent. And since then, we've seen that area really surge in terms of economic development, streetscape improvements, um, some beautiful crosswalks that uh, draw on Filipino um, weaving patterns from the past, um, new trees planted. And it's really a symbol of how close the friendship between um, our nations and the city of Los Angeles and the Filipino people has been from the beginning. 
I often uh, cite the Philippines um, because of my own family's experience. My grandfather, uh, who is with me every single day here in the meetings on my desk, a picture of him from the World War II where he served in the Philippines, as a result became a United States citizen. Um, and the independence of uh, the Philippine nation is certainly not just for Southeast Asia, and, but for the entire world was a very important moment uh, in world history as well that we celebrate today. Those veterans who now live amongst us, uh, too, are recognized at the Lake Street Park, where um, a beautiful monument of five slabs of polished black granite now stands as part of the city's commemoration of the his history of Filipino veterans. Um, and in December of 2002, a motion was presented designated 4515 Eagle Rock Boulevard as Philippine Village Community Center so that the significant number of Filipinos that live in the Eagle Rock and Glassell Park and Highland Park and Mount Washington areas in Council Districts 14 and 1 would have a center uh, to call home to cultural events, community meetings, and other outreach services as well. Um, it is, I think, for all of us this month, the Filipino nation, as we celebrate 109 years since the Declaration of Philippine Independence on June 12, 1898 that the establishment of the first constitutional republic in all of Asia uh, occurred. And certainly that was a place for other countries to be inspired to take, have self-determination and for Asian peoples who are living under colonialism to be able to have full freedom. So it is fitting and proper for us to join together in um, as declaring the week of June 11th to 15th, 2007 as Philippine Independence Week in the city of Los Angeles and join the Los Angeles Filipino Association of City Employees um, who have really been a core of our city family here uh, on our own staffs in this room in each one of our departments, um, but also the Filipino American community of Los Angeles, FACLA, in the celebration of the 109th anniversary of Philippine independence. And with that, uh, before we get to the Mabuhays, I'd like to uh, get uh, uh, our council member from the first district, a great friend to the Filipino community as well, Council Member Ed Reyes, to say a few words. Thank you, Council President. It truly is an honor to be here celebrating the 109th anniversary of the Philippine independence. Um, we've been blessed because in, amongst our staff, amongst our city family, we have individuals who understand the immigrant experience, who understand what it is to struggle to be able to work with a, a different society, a new society, as we continue to assimilate into this great country. I've been very fortunate to have folks like, for example, Gerald Gubatan on my staff, who's been a chief planner, who's been an advocate and a planner, but also understands what it means when a person needs to have that housing, that needs to understand what it requires to provide that service for that ailing senior or for that child care. I had folks like Ruby DeVera, who's also used to be on my staff, who's been an advocate, worked with many council members and others to advocate for the community. So as we continue to share our experiences and be able to move these policies based on personal experiences, we're able to make this city that much greater, that much more livable. So to the Philippine community, congratulations. Continue to support you and look forward to celebrating another 109 years as we continue to evolve as a great country with great diversity. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Thanks. Mr. And Reyes. Mr. Mr. Garcetti, we do have Mr. Labonge Please. who would like to say a few words. Mr. Labonge. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President and uh, Mr. Garcetti, Mr. Reyes, this is great. Magada humaga, huh? You got that right there? And also, because I want to say this so important here, because I try every day to learn a little bit of everything. Mubahai ang Filipinas, okay? Uh, good. And one of the reasons why that happens to so many Angelinos is all the great nurses who come from the Philippines to fill the jobs that Los Angeles City College should be training more nurses for, but who come to our hospitals. And I'm just proud of the Filipinos uh, throughout Los Angeles. I'm proud of our uh, sister city with Makate. Uh, and I'm proud of what you've done collectively, Mr. Garcetti, Mr. Reyes, and Mr. Garcetti primary, the historic Filipino town, which does give roots to everyone uh, and says this is a special place. So I stand to congratulate all who've been involved, and especially on this Im invitation. I say salamat. Mr. Alec Mr. Alacone. I just would like to mention that a lot of people don't realize, but 
uh, one of the fastest growing communities in the San Fernando Valley is the Filipino community. In fact, I believe it is the uh, fastest growing community. The grammar school that I went to, which was about 90% uh, white and 10% Hispanic when I went to school, is now 50% uh, Filipino and 50% Hispanic. Uh, okay, there might be one or two other families there. Uh, the St. Genevieve's in Tony Cardenas, and, and, uh, which serves, uh, his, his, it's in his district, but, but the constituents uh, are equally shared between him and, and I, is about 80% Filipino now. And so it's a, a very dramatic change in our community. And so I want to uh, congratulate uh, uh, the Filipino community uh, next week and, and uh, every day of the year. Thank you. And on behalf of uh, approximately 4,000 city employees here of Filipino descent, which is almost a tenth of our entire work uh, force here in the city of Los Angeles, I'd like to uh, introduce Ruby DeVira to say some words on this very special occasion. Ruby DeVira. Thank you, Council Member Garcetti, Council Member Reyes. Today marks the 109th anniversary of Philippine independence, 109 years of struggle for freedom, a day that's close to our hearts, close to millions of Filipinos who just don't live in Los Angeles, but across the nation. We are thankful for the thousands of Filipino employees who have continuously worked as accountants, auditors, engineers, clerks, purchasing agents, and in various capacities legislative deputies, of course. There's too many of them to mention. In the early 1970s, there were a handful of Filipinos in city service. Most of them have since retired, dedicating 30 to 40 years of service, the best years of their lives, to make the city the epitome of government, agencies in the state of California and in the United States. Today, Filipinos number an estimated 4,000 in various fields are now holding upper management level jobs as deputy mayor, high ranking managerial positions, various departments, including city council. We are proud of our heritage and contributions. Yesterday, the Filipino American Los Angeles Democrats honored 45 Filipinos for their dedication as staff members of elected officials from the federal level down to the city. We have all come long ways, but our most uplifting thought this year has been that we learn about each other. The more we realize that we are all alike, the same color blood runs in our veins, and we inspire each other to realize also our most heartfelt yearnings. On behalf of the Los Angeles Filipino Association of City Employees, LaFace, now celebrating its 25th year of service to the city, we thank you for this proclamation. Marami salamat po at mabuhay tayong lahat. Um, Mr. Uh, Rosendahl would also like to make a few comments, Mr. Corsetti. Mr. Rosendahl. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I've had the pleasure and the honor to be to the Philippines. Uh, I actually um, interviewed, when I was a uh, television guy, your president, at your White House, a great lady that has shown uh, great leadership uh, internationally for all of us. But what I want to say is I want to thank you very much because the whole nursing opportunities in America in part have come because the Filipinos have stepped up to the plate. Uh, the millions of Filipinos throughout the world um, that are working in service operations bring some of that money back to the Philippines, a country, frankly, that needs more support to build a stronger middle class. The poverty there is unbelievable, as you all know, in Manila and, and in some of the slums. But the leadership um, of the Philippine people to the world and connecting has been very gratifying, especially to us in Southern California, where we felt the presence over the years. So bless you all and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosendahl. And um, I know the mayor couldn't be here, but uh, I wanted to afford the deputy mayor, Kevin Acebo, a chance to say something on his behalf on this very special occasion. I know he's hiding over there at the Filipino caucus, but I think, it's, I think we should all give him a round of applause and thank him on behalf of the mayor. That was very good, Mr. Garcetti. 
<laughs> Madam Chair, members, on behalf of the Mayor, we want to first recognize what a great celebration this is. It really celebrates a community that sits in the fabric of diversity, of greatness, which makes the greatness of Los Angeles. This council continues to embrace the diversity of this city in many ways. And, and, and the Filipino-American community is definitely one of many beneficiaries. So we thank you and we celebrate this day with great joy. Thank you, thank you Mr. President. Thank you very much. Uh, and, Mr. Uh, no, Mr. Oh, Car sorry, we have one more. Mr. Sir, Cardenas. Is Eduardo Angeles here? Eddie, he's right there. Eddie? Eddie? <laughs> Do I need to speak to Gala for you to understand me? We have the highest ranking person in the city attorney's office here who helps us here on the city council, keeps us straight. This is turning into a real Everybody, yeah. I think it's appropriate that we give him an opportunity to say a few words and uh, to express his appreciation for not only for the city, but for the wonderful opportunity that his family has given him by coming to Los Angeles. And he's a fine individual and someone that you, as the Filipino community, should be very proud of. Go ahead, Eddie. Magandang gabi sa inyo lahat. Salamat para dito. This is a great opportunity for us with respect to being an Independence Day. Um, on behalf of Rocky Delgadillo, the city attorney, it is an honor uh, to be here. Thank you to Councilmember Cardenas, Madam Chair, and for the recognition of the fact that as a Filipino-American, as an immigrant, uh, coming here when I was seven years old, um, making a dream come true as a Filipino-American, uh, to be here in Los Angeles, to have a name that's um, Angeles is, uh, is an honor and it truly is uh, special for us as a community to, you to, to recognize us and celebrate uh, our heritage and celebrate us as a community. Thank you very much. Madam President. Mr. Cardenas. Th thank you, Eddie. I don't understand Tagalog, but I'm sure it was wonderful because you got a lot of smiles and applauses. But uh, I'd just like to add that, that my father didn't speak very much English or what have you, but he came here and started working in the fields in the Central Valley of California. And I remember this. I remember this. One time we got into one of the few conversations that I had with my father, a very quiet man, and he told me with a big smile on his face how hard working the Filipinos were in the fields because he was very proud of himself and when he used to work in the fields, he always used to like to compete and be the, the hardest working person out there. And he said with a smile on his face, he said, the people who gave me a run for my money when I was working out there in the hot sun were the Filipino community. They are hard working people. And I interpret that as meaning that when I see the smile on my father's face and my grandfather's face on this picture that I have in my office, he's working in the fields. They're smiling. I would hate it if I had to do that for a living. But they're smiling. And the reason why they're smiling is because they, they appreciate the opportunity to have that job. And that's what I interpret when my father was smiling and commemorating and thanking the Filipino community for being such hardworking partners with him when he used to work. So I just wanted to share that with you and also say thank you to Eduardo who works for me, who tells me stories about his grandma who's Filipina, and also to Donna who just left to Princeton University, to, who's leaving to Princeton University soon on my staff. Thank you so much for giving us your sons and daughters. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Garcetti, I know you have a proclamation, but I want to add my, my uh, congratulations uh, to everyone, and Ruby, who's worked on this for so many years, um, and to Mr. Garcetti uh, and Mr. Reyes uh, for their activities. And a special shout-out to my staff member, Elaine De Leon, uh, who was honored last night uh, with a group of other uh, elected official staff uh, from the Filipino-American community. And so I, I want to uh, let everyone know that we in the city do appreciate and embrace diversity, and it's really a wonderful day to be able to celebrate the Independence Day. Thank you very much, Mr. Garcetti. Thank you. And, and with that, on behalf of Mr. Reyes and I would like to present to Mr. Vera and, and to all of our guests that are here in the entire Filipino-American community the celebratory proclamation for the 109th anniversary of Philippine independence. Tom Lavon's already said it once, but Mabuhay ang nga Filipino. We have uh, one short song for you. This is a song that's uh, very moving song of pride in our heritage, our dreams, our inspirations, and our hope for the future. Ako ay Pilipino. And to sing this...
Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you. And I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Reyes uh, for our next uh, two presentations. Thank you, Madam President. On behalf of Councilman Jose Wissar and the entire City Council, I'm proud to recognize Comunidad en Movimiento, a program of, yes, you deserve an applause, a program of Proyecto Pastoral at Dolores Mission Church run by Latina women, for Latina women in the Boyle Heights community. In February, this high-impact community-based program won the prestigious 2007 Margaret Cafferty Development of People Award in Washington, D.C. This Cafferty Award is awarded annually by the Catholic Campaign for Human Development, the Domestic Anti-Poverty Program of the U.S. Catholic Bishops. The women of Comunidad en Movimiento are deeply rooted in their faith, and from their faith, they are motivated to perform extraordinary acts of community service. The Safe Passage Campaign that began in 1999 is one example. CEM organized more than 50 trained community volunteers to safely escort children who are walking home from school. CEM has also collaborated with local police to create a community policing program based on models used in other cities but adapted to meet the needs identified by the residents of Bell Heights. Finally, CM hosts training workshops for women in a wide variety of topics, including health, self-defense, and art. Their motto is, see, think, and act, representing a grassroots approach to solving many of our society's pro problems. Have a beautiful resolution signed by the city council, as well as the mayor, controller, and city attorney, as presented by the city. I present this to our president. Yes. Bienvenidos. This is for you, for all your hard work and all your accomplishments and your acknowledgement for all the rewards and serving our community. On behalf of Jose Wisar and the City Council. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, and we also have a certificate to recognize Rita Chavez for being such an integral figure for Comunidad en Movimiento through her leadership, strength, and commitment to economic disadvantage. Congratulations, Rita. So I want to thank them for their hard work. Congratulations. Council Wissar is here in spirit. His staff has been very gracious in supporting us in this effort. And I want to thank you for all your hard work. Felicidades y ojalá que sigan adelante con más fuerza y más ánimo. Felicidades. And 
Mr. Reyes, um, I know Mr. Labonge would like to say a few words. Mr. Labonge. I'm going to have him take a, a beautiful picture of this group here, Mr. Reyes, but I want to ask the fine gentleman with that beautiful shirt on in the back to step forward here, who's done so much good work throughout. He's kind of new to the neighborhood, uh, but uh, he's a great member of the Jesuit community, a great priest. Father, say us some good words there, will you? Uh, thank you. It's a great honor for us to be here. It's a great honor for me to stand uh, with these women who are the leaders of our community at Dolores Mission, who work uh, every day and put their lives on the line for the safety, especially of our children, so they can walk to and from school safely. Boyle Heights, as you know, um, there's a great deal of violence there. We're working to, um, to control that, to work with our kids to find alternatives. But in the meantime, our women... They, do, um, they put their lives in the line so that our kids can walk safely to and from school. So it's, it's a great honor just to be with all of you. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, Father John, if I could just say too, and I know I, I want to throw it over, the great work you did down the street on uh, Central Avenue for many, many years at Verbin Day High School. So we salute you, and it's wonderful too. It's all about our mothers, and it's about the women, you know, who really drive it. And we just had Memorial Day. And you know how Memorial Day got started? It was the women of the South who were, uh, who were taking care of the graves of the Confederate soldiers. And they saw the graves of the soldiers from the North, and no one was taking care of them. And they walked across and helped get those graves cleaned up. And they didn't see North or South, East or West, they just saw people. And that started what was Decoration Day and then to Memorial Day. Uh, which I know Boyle Heights had a wonderful program that Mr. Weezar shared in his community. So God bless the women of the world and the women of Boyle Heights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lamont. Thank you very much, Mr. Reyes. And I know you have a second presentation. We have one first like to. We just want to thank uh, Councilman Weezar for his support and his uh, hard working um, with us because we we are working for the safety of our children and the safety of our families and this is not just mine this is for the, all the women that work with me and that work with uh, with the community thank you les damos las gracias al concejal Wizar por el apoyo que nos ha dado la solidaridad para poder seguir adelante trabajando juntos. Gracias y por, por el bienestar de nuestros nietos, de nuestros hijos y de toda la comunidad. Agradecemos infinitamente y aquí presente para seguir trabajando. Gracias. ¿Y cómo se llama, señor? Mi nombre es Guadalupe Ruelas. Gracias, gracias. Ms. Ruelas, quiero agradecer al Consumer Wizard por su strength y su apoyo y por todos sus sacrificios en helping out the group. Muchas gracias. Seguimos adelante. Gracias. 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 Councilman has been very busy in this district. Uh, so I have one more presentation for him. It brings me so much pleasure to introduce to you some of the students and teachers at Oscar de la Hoya Animo Charter School. The word animo means a sense of, of will, strength, desire. It captures a certain attitude. And so the word animo in this instance speaks to that energy that we need to keep moving ahead. This charter school was founded to ensure that students from Boyle Heights and elsewhere in East Los Angeles get the education they deserve to be, to be successful in college, leadership, and life. The school was named after a real winner, Oscar de la Hoya, for a reason. Well, maybe not the last fight, but most of the times. And these kids are measuring up to that name. We are honoring these students for the following reasons. Earlier this year, as part of the National Engineers Week, Raytheon hosted a contest to interest students in science and engineering. These teachers and students decided to enter. Here's how the contest works. Each of the 15 groups got a big pile of hardware equipment. In just one hour, each team had to build a working hovercraft. This team, whose hovercraft 
went the furthest one. The Oscar de la Hoya team went 15 yards. And I think that's even better than 10 rounds. I'm not sure de la Hoya would like that, but that's supposed to be the joke. <laughs> so I'd like to present the certificate, this resolution to the students, teachers, parents, and administrators of the Oscar de la Hoya Animo Charter School. Congratulations. I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Cardenas, who'd like to say a few words as well. Yes. I just have a quick question for you bright young people. How many of you want to be engineers? You're all supposed to raise your hand. <laughs> well, let me tell you why you should raise your hand. Because once you get your engineering degree, you can do anything. It is a great discipline. It is an opportunity for you to learn and challenge yourself. It's one of the most challenging bachelor's degrees you can get. And uh, even though Alex Valdia was able to get one, it's, it's really hard. Uh, that was a joke, like Ed Reyes' joke. Uh, but, but anyway, my, my point to you is, no matter what you do, I think this is a great opportunity for you to be inspired, have fun, and realize that in technology, you can have a lot of fun, and there's great opportunities. And for all of you, understand this. Go down the hall to the Board of Public Works and ask them how you can work on getting a job, maybe even with Raytheon this summer. Because this summer, along with engineering jobs and things of that nature, we're going to be looking to place about 10,000 young people this year, okay, uh, starting this summer. So there's great opportunities here. So congratulations on your award, and congratulations on your 15 yards. And before I ask the um, Director of Government Affairs, Alma Matke, I'd like to recognize the following students present them with certificates. We have with us Alejandra Garcia. Understand is the pilot. Is that correct? <laughs> there you are. Congratulations, Alejandra. Beautiful. Juan Rojas. Juan? There you are. Congratulations, Juan. Thank you. This will look nice in your living room. Uh, we have with us Jose Tinoco. Is that correct? Thank you. We also have with us our teachers, Mitch Goldenberg. Mitch? <laughs> and Helene Powell. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to introduce to you Alma Marquez. Thank you so much, Councilman Reyes and Councilman Huizar. On behalf of the Green Dot family, who you all may know is strongly pushing for school reform in Los Angeles to give all children a high-quality education, we are so proud of our students at Oscar de la Hoya Animo because in our hearts we know that they exemplify the potential that all children have to succeed in anything that they set their mind to. Thank you very much for this recognition. We certainly appreciate it. So with that, I'd like to congratulate Councilman Wissar for all his hard work, the great community folks he's recognizing, and these are all role models for the whole city. Congratulations. Congratulations to the staff. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mr. Reyes. And the school was also honored last Friday night by Teleku, um, and, uh, which was great. I'd like to now acknowledge uh, our colleague, Mr. Herb Wesson, for our next presentations. Good morning, uh, Madam President and members. Today is a, a, a very, very special uh, Friday for me. It's special because it's my favorite Friday because it's Pet Adoption Friday, where we look for uh, parents for the lovely little puppies and cats. So it's a very special uh, Friday because of that reason. Also today, I'm going to recognize one of the 
the most successful and committed organizations in the district that I represent and uh, Chief Parks represents and uh, Councilwoman Perry represents, and that's the organization that's Mothers in Actions. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge that I have my own mother in action is here today. Could you give a round of applause to my mother, Gladys Wesson? And just to show you, Mom, how much I love you, I'm going to get this dog for you, okay? Is that a... <laughs> I tried to call my wife, and I think she knows because she's refusing to answer the telephone. What we have today is a beautiful little girl, a little daddy's baby who has no name. She's only five months she is a Chihuahua and Dachshund mix. I have been told, and she only weighs maybe four pounds, that she will only grow another two to three pounds. So this is your poor man's Paris Hilton dog. <laughs> so anybody... Well, it would only be fitting in honor of her freedom to uh, <laughs> adopt this dog. And we, we, we want this little doggy to be free. She is looking for a home. If you ever really want unconditional love, then get a companion animal. For those of you that are interested in this daddy's little baby, and if you blow in her nose, she'll snap at you, which I think is cute. Anyway, no, I don't want to bite, bite my nose on channel 35. We have to call 911. But anyway, Anyone who is interested, she is ready to go. She's been, uh, she has a shot. She's been spayed. She's microchipped. You can call 888-452-7381. Again, 888-452-7381. She will make a great Father's Day gift. And uh, whoever adopts her, please call me back and let me know what her name is. Miss Trudy? I may have to, I don't know. I don't know. It'll give me only 18 dogs. Uh, I, I think a great name would be Herbina. Herbina. Somebody please adopt Herbina. Uh, at, at, at this point in time, if I could ask Janice, if I could ask Janice Hahn and uh, Bernard Parks to come up and join me in this presentation. Miss Treaty, don't get rid of the dog yet. I, I'm still waiting on my wife to call me back. Someone's waving in the back. In the corner. Oh, no. <laughs> It is with great honor, and I'm glad that I'm being joined by my dear friend Bernard Parks and uh, another dear friend Janice Hahn, as we recognize Mothers in Action, an organization that was started uh, right after the uh, civil unrest in 1992. The founding members of this organization uh, reads as a who's who in the uh, South Central Los Angeles community. The chair of that community is a woman who basically taught me how to be chief of staff to a county supervisor, and that's the great uh, Lillian Mobley, who is one of my other mothers. Also, the president and CEO, CEO of uh, Mothers in Action is Brenda Mars Mitchell. Another founder was Mary Henry, Nola Carter, Gwen, Gwen Green, uh, Danny Bakewell Sr., who got honorary uh, membership into honorary Mothers. Mother. Yeah, he's an honorary mother and the, the, the late and, and great uh, Johnny, Johnny Tillman. I could go on and on about the various things that they do, but I just want to highlight two of them. For several years, they've 
uh, sponsored one of the largest back-to-school programs in the South Central area, maybe within the city of Los Angeles. And I know that Janice, uh, Bernard, and others, we have always supported it. And it just amazes me how you see thousands and thousands, I'm talking 10, 12 thousands of kids go there and get their total supplies that they need from school. I'm talking backpacks, pencils, I mean, whatever they need, computers, glass, I forgot, they do eye screening, if they need glasses, they get glasses. Another thing was last year, and, and Bernard and I were really involved in this, somebody came up with this crazy idea that we would close off Crenshaw Boulevard from uh, Martin Luther King to like 29th Street, and Bernard and I kind of begrudgingly agreed to have an event, a two-day event called the Taste of Soul. It was an unbelievable surprise with 35 to 40,000 people attending. We had various uh, uh, chefs and cooks from all over, entertainment. It was a fun weekend and now we're really looking forward to, we began the planning process just a, a few days ago, so we're really looking forward to that. But I could go on and on and on from feeding the homeless, helping seniors, you name it, wherever there's a need, you will find mothers in action. With that said, I'm going to ask Janice to say a few words, and then I will bring up my uh, colleague, uh, Council Member Parks. Janice Hahn, everyone. Thank you, Herb, for letting us have the opportunity to honor mothers in action. Uh, and of course, uh, we know that if something needs to get done, it's going to be the women, uh, and it's particularly going to be the mo it's particularly going to be Anne Bernard and her. It's going to be mothers, uh, and Mothers in Action really epitomizes uh, an organization that looks at what is needed for our kids and then helps make it happen. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here today to honor Mothers in Action. And Lillian Mobley, you are. Uh, you are the champion mother. Uh, you, are th you are the champion. You are the warrior. You are the fighter uh, for all of those who don't have a voice, uh, who sometimes don't get what they need. Uh, and I am honored to stand here with you today, uh, along with, with all of the mothers in action, to honor you, to thank you, and to say you fill the gap that even government can't do. Even government cannot do what Mothers in Action do. So we thank you. We thank you for taking those who are in greatest need and providing them with what they need, and that's our kids. Thank you. Uh, let me say thank you, Herb, for bringing in the Mothers in Action. And uh, it just brings back memories with Mrs. Mobley and Mary Henry. They used to uh, uh, routinely, uh, as a young police officer, beat us to death about <laughs> Uh, ensuring that we dealt with the public properly and, and the insistence that uh, the community deserved the proper police protection and enforcement and not uh, to take on an attitude that we were there occupying the community. And uh, Mary Henry and uh, Ms. Mobley, I'll be forever grateful for that education. Uh, but the Mothers in Action, I think, has been such a wonderful uh, program that came out of uh, destruction in our city. Uh, one of the things that I learned uh, when we had the first back-to-school program, we all knew what the purpose of the backpacks and pencils and uh, paper were about. But the thing that was so educational is that the Mothers in Action actually brought doctors out and they began to give physical examination. And the first one that I attended, they had a young man that could not have been more than 10 or 12 years old that had a high blood pressure rate that was so high that they considered hospitalization yet he was walking around looking as normal as any other kid and that's a part of the back to school is the physical the eye exam but the supplies but the most important uh, is giving some medical attention to families that do not have the ability to pay for that medical attention. Uh, the other issue uh, and Brenda is probably the only one that can get me to do this every Thanksgiving I have to show up at Ward AME Church she gives me a handful of dinners and I have to deliver them to those uh, members of the community that are shut in. 
and provide uh, Thanksgiving dinner. And so that's my annual contribution. She doesn't let me eat there. She, let, she makes me work that day. And so I'm looking, again, forward for that. And then, as Herb mentioned, on the taste of uh, soul on Crenshaw, it could not have come out better if you placed it, on a, uh, drawn it up, to see the number of people in the middle of Crenshaw having a great time, and immediately while it was going on and it was closing down, people were saying, when is the next one? Because uh, people uh, feeling as though for the, one of the few times they had in that large numbers to have an event in the middle of the community, the middle of Crenshaw Boulevard, to where everything went well. Great weather, great event, great food, and the entire program was something that was very positive. And we're just pleased to be a part of that planning effort for uh, this coming year. So I want to say also to Mothers in Action, keep up the good work. Uh, that legacy will be there for a long period of time as we move forward in the future. I want to bring my, my, all of my, Miss Mobley come up, my mother. These are, this is, this is my mother. You took your sunglasses off? For just a minute. Put them back on. She just had surgery. Put your eyes back on. She's not impersonating Ray Charles. She's protecting her eyes. I'm not trying to be cool. She's not trying to be cool is what she said. But anyway, the, 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 these ladies behind me have taught me a lot. I learned a lot about hospitals and medical care from you and and Miss Mobley helped me understand that it's more important to give than to get and my mother basically taught me everything that I know and and Brenda Mars who's the CEO of this organization asked me to remind you that their latest campaign is called Respect Me and it's about individuals of uh, color receiving the women receiving the respect that they deserve from various artists and singers and performers Performers. With that said, I'm going to ask uh, the president and CEO, an individual that when she calls you, trust me, yeah. you return her call. An individual when she calls you, and whatever it is that she wants, it's better for you to just give it to her. Trust me, you get off cheaper. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Brenda Marsh Mitchell. Thank you, Herb. Uh, thank you, Councilman Parks and Councilwoman Hahn and Jan Perry. I call her in the middle of the night, too. Uh, first of all, Mothers in Action, we pray, we vote, right. we take care of our families, we take care of our community, and we raise sand for our family and our community. I'm just not saying the real word. <laughs> but we are, today, we are 5,000 strong. We're very short today. We're happy to say we have mothers working in schools. When you go to Horseman Junior High School, the first thing you see every day is a mother in action. We have mothers at graduations today. We have students graduating from co various colleges uh, this month. And we're very proud of our uh, commitment to educating our community through voter education, through health. You know, children fail in school because they can't hear. They fail because they can't see. So if we can be a part of that by having our back to school event, we will. And we will have to call on each and every one of you at various times to help us with our endeavor. And we really want to thank Councilman Parks, Councilman Weston, and Councilwoman Jan Perry for and the mayor for always coming on Thanksgiving Day to deliver meals. Everybody is not blessed to have a meal on Thanksgiving Day. Everybody in our city is not blessed to have company on Thanksgiving Day. So it's really a good thing because a lot of the people that do not have are the people that go to the polls on Election Day. Thank you again. Thank you, uh, Mr. President and members. We're going to go in the, the back, take a few photographs. If you could follow Ed Johnson right here. And Ed, take the resolution. Thank you very much, Mr. Wesson. And our next presentation will be uh, Council Member uh, Tony Cardenas of Council District 6. Where's Ms. Mobley?
Thank you very much, Council President. Joining me here is uh, one of our city workers, and he's retiring, Larry Lamar Tinson and his family. Uh, we take great pleasure in congratulating Larry Tamar Tinson upon his retirement from the City of Los Angeles after 34 and a half years of service with the City of Los Angeles. Larry is a Los Angeles native and is a member of the first graduating class the summer of 1969 of Crenshaw High School and attended West Los Angeles Junior College, San Fernando Valley College, now known as Cal State University Northridge, Pepperdine University, Los Angeles campus, Trade Tech College, Mount Sac and UCLA Extension Westwood campus. Young people, if you're watching, pay attention because Mr. Tinson is a perfect example of why you should take advantage of the opportunities when we, the City of Los Angeles, offer you a job as a young person. And as I said earlier, this year we're looking to hire 10,000 young people in the City of Los Angeles. Now listen carefully and you can understand what it leads to. Mr. Tinson <clears throat> entered city service on August 7, 1972 with the Department of Public Utilities and Transportation, known today as General Services, as a messenger clerk in the mailroom. Remember that, a messenger clerk in the mailroom. In 1974, Larry was promoted to the Department of Water and Power Commercial Division accounts receivable as a clerk. In 1975, Larry was promoted to senior clerk in the office of the city clerk, tax and permit division. He also worked for the treasurer's office, municipal bond section, as well as in the mailroom at the public utilities transportation. In 1976, Larry went on to complete his probation in the teller unit with the Office of the City Clerk, Tax and Permit Division. On November 1976, Larry promoted to parking meter collector within the Office of the City Clerk, Tax Permit Division. On April 1980, right around the time I was in high school, Larry promoted to vehicle nuisance inspector with Building and Safety Conservation Division. In July of 1993, Larry returned to the Office of the City Clerk as a Senior Citizens Exemption Unit. In 1994, Larry promoted to tax and permit field representative with the Office of the City Clerk, Tax and Permit Division. Larry Tinson was assigned to the Revenue Enhancement Unit meet Metro and is a criminal complaint investigator in the Criminal Complaint Unit, the assessment unit at the Central Field Office. Soon after, promoted, he was promoted to Tax Compliant Officer 2 with the Van Nuys Field Office. He is, Larry also has numerous awards. He received the Certificate of Appreciation for Outstanding Citizenship by then Councilperson Pat Russell. Also a Certificate of Appreciation for Outstanding Citizenship and Activities Enhancing Community Betterment for his work at Grace Lutheran Church presented by Councilmember Jan Perry. Also a Certificate of Appreciation for Summer 8th District Neighborhood Cleanup Campaign Building and Safety by Councilperson Robert Farrell. Also a Certificate of Appreciation for Outstanding Citizenship, Building and Safety presented by Councilperson Ruth Galanter. He also received a letter of commendation from Mayor James K. Hahn, commending him for his dedication and responsive customer service with the Office of Finance. With that, I'd like to uh, give the microphone to uh, the General Manager, Antoinette Cristobal, to say a few words about uh, our guest today. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Larry, I just want to say on behalf of the Office of Finance, uh, we really appreciate your dedicated years of service. You have done a phenomenal job in our department, and we are truly uh, going to miss you, and uh, we wish you well in your retirement. And I also want to say uh, Larry's uh, wife, Sudi, uh, used to work for the Office of Finance as well, and we miss her as well. Larry, enjoy your retirement. With that, I'd like to give Larry Lamar Tinson a long-awaited opportunity to say a few words about what it's like to work for the City of Los Angeles. Larry? Good morning. As a young kid, I came to City Hall first as a field trip, and they took us into the mayor's office. At that time, I had no idea that I would ever work for the City of Los Angeles. 
I came in my senior year of college, and I only came in because at that time you had to make X amount of dollars to keep your scholarships and everything else going for your portion. So I said I would come in, work a few weeks, make me a little money, and go back to school. 34, year, 34 and a half years later, I still haven't finished school, but I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of the citizens and do a lot of good things, I believe. I encourage young people when they come into the city of Los Angeles, this is a career. You represent your community and yourself. Be proud of what you do, and you can go uh, tremendous places within the city. Some of you may wind up, especially young, they come in right, can wind up as general managers. So uh, for the city of Los Angeles, as an uh, employer, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to work for you. With that, I'd like to give this resolution to Larry Lamar Tinson for his wonderful dedication for 34 and a half years. And thank you for your appreciation and thank you for your effort and your workmanship. And thank you for sharing those words to the young people. This truly is a great city and a great opportunity to start a career. And those of you who want to start working with the city of Los Angeles, start looking right now because we have jobs for you. So congratulations, Larry. Thank you very much, Mr. Carter. This is our last presentation today. It will be by uh, council member from the 8th District, the Honorable Bernard Parks. Yes, Mr. Wesson. Council member Parks begins his presentation. I just wanted to know, would this be an appropriate time to indicate that little Herbina has just been adopted right. by a staff member from Councilman Parks' office. All right, Mr. Parks. Mr. Parks, I think you have a present at home awaiting you when you get there tonight. He's got to get it. You come on each side of me. Take off those visitors' tags. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, today, uh, the 8th District is going to honor uh, two of five teachers from the 8th District that were recently honored uh, for their teaching skills in a program called Teachers Making a Difference. The Cherry Blossom Festival of Southern California honored them in 2007. Uh, they honored nine schools, uh, five of them from the 8th District the 42nd Street Elementary, uh, Southwest Area, Charles uh, Barrett Elementary, uh, Southeast Area, 74th Street, Gifted Magnet, South, which is in our South Area, Crenshaw High School, which is in our High Park, Mesa Heights Area, and Martin Luther King Elementary, which is in our West Area of our district. The festival celebrates recognizing teachers uh, with the teachers making a difference. It's given that these teachers have a classroom skills to make a difference in their students as well as interaction and communications with parents and their peers. Uh, CD8 had the largest number of nominations in the city of LA and also the largest number of teachers selected. Uh, what we have started in the 8th District is a program called our STAR program where we honor students who have achieved so today we're honoring what we call the stars of the 8th District stars. And so these are the people that make our students what they are. First of all, uh, one of our recipients is Dottie Stallworth. She's a second grade magnet uh, school teacher at 74th Street, uh, which is a gifted magnet. Uh, she's viewed by her peers as the first teacher at school every day and also the last one to leave. She also has an annual farmer's market at the school, a living museum, and the culmination science fair where she invites the whole school to attend to take part in the festivities. She's developed her own projects that include real life experiences and extended research. We also have Renita Sutton. She's a 10th through 12th grade teacher in mathematics at Crenshaw High School. Uh, she's also the co-chair of the math department and serves uh, that role while she 
uh, also models lessons for her colleagues and mentors new colleagues. Uh, she ensures that math teachers have smart boards and other high-tech teaching techniques and provides teacher training on equipment as well as explaining the mythology. We wanted to honor uh, all five of our instructors, but uh, three of them had to be in uh, school assignments. We were able to steal Ms. Stallworth and Ms. Sutton away, and so I'd like to present them with our 8th District certificates to uh, honor them in behalf of our students in helping make our students better each and every year, but to, as, as far as following up with the Cherry Blossom Award. Let me give you that. Now, are we going to do it? Let me get you come up and say, say some words, and we're going to take pictures later. Okay. Oh, oops, that's okay. I'm just very honored and grateful for this award. When I started teaching, <clears throat> excuse me, four years ago, I never thought that um, I'd be receiving an award from Councilman Parks. But I recognize that um, from the different presentations given today, that it's not just me doing a a nice job in the classroom. It's the mothers in action that I see every morning, um, greeting our students and, and the different graduates like Mr. Tenson um, from Crenshaw High School that help make my job more rewarding. So thank you for the award. Good morning. I want to accept this award on behalf of um, all the teachers in LA because I think that we are some of the hardest working people in our great city. Uh, to our Councilman Bernard Parks and my principal, Mr. Andre Cunningham, who is the principal of 74th Street, I'm deeply honored to accept this award. Socrates said, an unexamined life is not worth living. And to that, I would like to add, an unshared life is not worth living. And part of my ministry is working with the boys and girls of our great city. Thank you again. Thank you very much, and congratulations to you both, and thank you, Councilmember Parks. That will uh, close our, our special presentations. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Alarcon, Cardenas, Gruel, Hahn, Weasel, LaBonge, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, Smith, Weiss, Weston, Zein, Garcetti. Twelve members present, and a quorum is present. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. First order of business, please. Approval of the minutes. Uh, Mr. Zine moves and Mr. Park seconds. Without objection, those will be approved. Next order of business. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Uh, Mr. Rosendahl moves and uh, Mr. Reyes seconds. Without objection, those two will be approved. Next order of business. Mr. President, would you like to take up public comment at this time? Uh, let's run through the agenda real quick and we'll come back to public comment. First items. Before beginning the regular agenda, there has been a request to continue item 16 to June 13th. Okay, colleagues, is there any objection to continuing item 16 to the 13th of June? Seeing none, so ordered. On the regular agenda, items 1 through 8 are street lighting district items. Notice for public hearing. Okay. Uh, we do not have any cards on 1 through 8, so we will... Uh, that's just, is that to open and continue, or is that to open? That's here? actually confirming the assessments. Okay, so we'll open and close the public hearings on one through eight. Uh, let's, anybody wishing to call those items special? Seeing none, let's go ahead, open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Those are approved. Next items, please. Items nine through sixteen, with the exception of sixteen that was continued, are items for which public hearings have been held. Mr. Alicon? Mr. President, I'd like to have item ten referred back to Plum. Okay. So any objection to that? Not. We'll continue. I mean, sorry. Send item 10 back to Plum. Uh, other specials, colleagues? Nine through uh, 15. Mr. Sorry, 11. Called special. No, 11 back to Plum, special for Mr. Alacon, and we have cards on 15, and as well as. It's okay. Mr. President, I'm I'm still learning it's and relearning. <laughs> uh, item number. 12, we want to re 11, we want to refer, uh, continue the item for two weeks. Two item weeks. Number 15, we'd like to continue for one week. Okay. If there is no objection, we will continue 10 for one week. That would be to June 15th. Actually, Mr. President, 10 is referred back to Plum. I'm oh, sorry, 11 to June 15th then. And yeah. two weeks on item 15 would take us to June 23rd without objection. We did have a card on the record, two cards for number 15. And just to, just to reconfirm, it was one week for 11, two weeks for 15? It's one week other, for way, other way around. Okay, my apologies. So the 23rd for item number 11 and the 15th for item number 15. Okay, any other specials, colleagues? 
Actually, Mr. President, it's June 22nd. June 22nd. Mr. Uh, Garcetti, um, Mr. Parks would like item 14 called special. 14 for Mr. Parks. And it's, we're not quite at 18, but we'll get that when we get there. Mr. Weiss? Hey, I want to do an introduction, Mr. President. Yeah, hold on. Two okay. seconds, and I'll, and I'll recognize you right after we vote on these. So on the balance, Madam Clerk, if we can open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Those are approved. Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, colleagues, I just want to introduce, we've got a bunch of kids in the back. Guys, can you wave? Warner Avenue? All right. And if the cameras could, come on, guys, shoot the back of the council chambers. We have the third grade from Warner Avenue Elementary, Ms. Tanaguchi's class. If we could ask, there we go. Okay, guys, so boys and girls, wave so you can be on TV tonight. Welcome to City Hall, guys. Welcome, and thank you for being here in Council Chambers. We hope you will come back very soon. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Uh, next items, Mr. Clerk. Items 17 through 26 are items which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration, and there are cards on 17 and 18. Okay. We'll call those special for cards from the public. Other specials, Ms. Gruel? Yes? Item number 18. 18 for, is special. Mr. Rosendahl, Mr. Parks, and cards. Seems to be a very special item, so we will definitely be hearing that one. Other specials? Yeah, Mr. President, I understand there is a substitute motion that's being drafted for 25A. Do you wish to hold that on the desk? Uh, that's now circulated. It's just uh, right here. Here's a copy of it for you. I can go ahead and take that up. Um, any specials beyond that, colleagues? If not, we'll open and close the public hearings on the balance. And please open the roll on the balance, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. That is approved. Uh, if we can recess the regular meeting, call roll for a special meeting, please. Alicon Cardinus, Gruel, Hahn, Weasel, LaBonge, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, Smith, Weiss, Weston, Zion, Garcetti, 12 members present, and a quorum, Mr. President. Thank you. Colleagues, uh, we do have a card on item 27 that requires public hearing, is that correct? It does require public okay, hearing. Okay, we'll call that special, and if we could continue that back into the regular agenda, please. Okay, returning to uh, public comment at this time, I'd like to uh, call forward uh, Damon Sampson for public comment. Damon. Sampson the second. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Damon O. Sampson the second. Um, basically, I'd like to first like to thank the Office of Public Works for Clean Alley located at 1408 West 90th Place. Cleaned it in a very timely manner. I'd like to thank them. I'd also like to thank all the responsible parties for uh, placing the new reflective signs that I came down and asked for a couple weeks ago. And the most of the cops that you guys have placed at uh, various intersections, uh, near crosswalks, intersections that are adjacent to schools. Uh, that's good for, for the safety of the, of the children. At this time, also suggest, suggesting that speed bumps, speedometers, which allow the motors to view the speed of the vehicle that they're traveling in, or some other device that can be utilized to deter motorists from exceeding the speed limit, be placed to ensure the welfare of both pedestrians and motorists. Uh, later today, I'll be taking a disc to uh, Bernard Park's office of an accident that I personally recorded at the intersection of 62nd Normandy on June the 5th at 10.21 a.m. Uh, the video clearly shows a motorist uh, failing to come to a complete stop at a stop sign and causing an accident. So I'd like for the council to please uh, play speed bumps, speedometer, something of that nature, especially near the schools. I have children, that small children that are in school at the cross street to go to school, and I appreciate sure you guys too. do too. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate your comments today. That closes our general public comment. Uh, if we can return to the items called special, Mr. Clerk. Item 14 was called special by Councilmember Parks. Okay. Mr. Parks, we have item number 14. I'd like to recognize you at this time. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, what I'd like to just bring forward is uh, and certainly appreciate the uh, City Council's effort in looking at so many uh, past tragedies in the sense that we've had people that we've honored uh, in the sense of uh, highlighting the issue of the Armenian Genocide. We certainly cannot forget about the Holocaust. Uh, we have also uh, had different kinds of activities that deal with Dafar and also Rwanda. And one of the issues that we as a council took position on recently was the reparations issue. And one of the things I think is so important as we look at issues that have been uh, truly uh, negative in our past, either in this country and others, 
is that if we combine all of the prior genocides and holocausts and all of the different uh, names that are ca captured as to this human sacrifice, they would probably total less than what has occurred with slavery and also the impact on lives as it relates to disjoining of families, the selling of families, the loss of people being transported across uh, uh, continents and being deposited throughout uh, this country, throughout this world in different uh, Central, South America and, and to the United States. Uh, as we look at today, uh, there is a resolution before uh, Congress that talks about uh, the issue of apology for slavery. And it's something in which goes hand in hand with a recent resolution that was passed in which the United States finally came to grips with a apology for lynching where we had that motion in council or in committee and talked about uh, the number of people in this country over the last several hundred years that were lynched mostly in the South, mostly people of color. Well, today we have an opportunity to support uh, the uh, House Resolution 194 submitted by uh, Congressman Cohen that talks about uh, the United States introducing in 2007 an acknowledgement of the fundamental injustice, cruelty, brutality, and inhumanity of slavery and the Jim Crow laws that came after them. Also an apology to African Americans on behalf of the people of the United States for the wrong wrongs committed against them and their ancestors who suffered under slavery in the Jim Crow laws. And finally, and expressed its commitment to rectify the lingering consequences of the misdeeds committed against African Americans under slavery and Jim Crow laws and stop the occurrence of human rights violations in the future. Uh, this goes hand in hand with other efforts throughout the United States in which uh, I believe the first state, uh, Florida, uh, Virginia, led the way in, in uh, creating uh, a legislation and other states are moving in that direction. And I'd ask, as we have done with almost every other identifiable injustice uh, in this world, that we find the time to vote unanimously on this issue so that we can send a clear message that although we have made great progress in a number of issues, all the rights, uh, all the wrongs have not been righted, and we certainly have a responsibility as a country to identify the breadth and depth of the impact of slavery on this country and many other continents in the world. So I'd ask for an aye vote. Thank you very much, Mr. Parks, and thank you for bringing this uh, to our attention. There's no other council members on the queue today. So with that, let's go ahead and open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That it is approved. Uh, next item, please. Item 17 was called special for cards from the public. Okay. Uh, Damon Sampson, the second on item number 17. Okay. <clears throat> item number 17, um, the REIT program. The rent escrow account program. Uh, it needs a complete overhaul. Um, I'm not sure if this council knows there's only one person uh, at the LA Housing Department who deals with uh, REAP. Um, I don't want to put him put his name out right now because I have some paperwork and I'm trying to get it processed. But um, I filed paperwork with this person over four months ago. And when I spoke to this person yesterday, he hadn't gotten to it yet. That was his response. And a four unit building, which I have, uh, with each unit being charged at a rate of $50 per month, which is placed into the, place into the re re um, program uh, at $20 per month or 12 months a year, is $2,400 per year. I'm already at uh, $1,200 uh, for the year due to someone or some entity's negligence or inability to properly delegate work assignments. You know, this guy telling me he didn't get to it yet. Um, so I'm at $1,200 because he didn't get to it. You know? um, Reasons such as this cause good, decent people such as myself, who are tax-paying citizens with a VA loan, throughout the military, to not come here and to move and relocate some for Arizona or Atlanta or somewhere. This is what causes that. And 
you know, you make it where it's like I said, make it where people don't want to invest in a city. I think it's a good city, a good people here, and you just make it where people like me don't want to be here when, you, when stuff like this happens. I can't get anything done with this LA Housing Department over on Seventh Street. I'm tired of going down there. I'm tired of calling them. It's really ridiculous. It needs a complete overhaul. Thank you. Oh, and also one more thing: they cancel their meetings every like every other week. They keep canceling their meetings, and it's really getting sickening because I can't go down there and speak to anyone on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that closes our public comment on this item. Anybody wishing to be heard from the council? If not, please open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. That is approved. Uh, we've had a request to hold 18 for a moment on the table. If we can go to item 27. We have a uh, speaker card, Mr. Sampson. Uh, Damon Sampson on item 27. Excuse me, sir. We can ask to get one of the sergeant arms. Mr. Sampson? We have item 27. Error. Item 27, sir. Your card on 27, sir. Yes. Um, I'm not sure of the uh, criteria regarding a credible um, witness or um, unavailable witness, but um, I do hope that if this council does approve this, that the uh, legislation is written on this is in favor of the uh, you know person that's being affected by this uh, by a crime or or whatever the case may be. I just hope that, like I said, when this legislation is written on this, you guys vote yay or nay on this. That this take consideration that this, uh, this could be someone's life or some uh, something hanging in the balance of this. And just please take that consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. And no further cards on that item. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if you would uh, open the roll. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Garcetti. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, you know, AB 268, uh, which we're voting on today, colleagues, addresses witness intimidation, um, which is a significant problem that faces, uh, that prosecutors face, especially in some of our gang homicide and domestic violence, um, elder abuse and child molestation cases. Um, in many of these cases, witnesses do not appear in court. Uh, to testify because they've been threatened, intimidated, um, uh, even threatened with murder. And the sobering uh, story that we had of a young boy who was sexually assaulted in El Sereno uh, two days ago uh, with that same, very same threat that he would be killed if he told anybody um, really focuses why this issue is important. And as a result, prosecutions may be hobbled, in some cases even dismissed. AB 268 brings California in line with federal rules and um, many states where there are forfeiture by wrongdoing hearsay exceptions that allow the introduction of otherwise excludable hearsay statements of victims or crimes or other witnesses when the defendant who is objecting to the admission of the statements uh, is in fact the very person responsible for the victim or witness being unavailable. Uh, we want people who are those victims um, of some of these crimes, especially with domestic violence and elder abuse, um, to be able to use that. And current California law provides no viable hearsay exemption, uh, exception excuse me, to permit the introduction of this evidence. This would close that loophole. It also addresses the problem that also often occurs in homicide, domestic violence, and child molestation cases when witnesses may be located and brought into court but may still refuse to testify. I know this city was one of the first places to have mandatory prosecutions in domestic violence cases, even where people were too scared to say anything, um, and even when they have uh, no Fifth Amendment privilege or have been given, been given immunity. So when a witness has been threatened, intimidated, or injured, experience reveals that that witness will often readily suffer any sanction imposed by the court rather than testify, um, especially if they believe that their, their life is in peril because of that. So this bill has already passed the Assembly. It's currently in the Senate. And I ask your support today, colleagues, for us to be on the record um, to help strengthen the chance that this bill will become law and help those uh, survivors of these, um, of these tragedies be able to have their voices heard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti. Our next speaker is Mr. Cardenas. So that was, that was me. I heard that. Uh, Mr. Clerk, would you please open the roll? Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Eleven ayes. And without objection, we'll send that forthwith. Uh, yes, Mr. Wesson. Yeah, Mr. President, would this be an appropriate time to indicate that uh, uh, on this day, 21 years ago, Jan Perry was born? So if we could all give Jan Perry, she's 21 years young today. Which we, makes we me fact, 23. Uh, 
we in fact have some cupcakes for um, Ms. Perry. I won't say your nickname. <laughs> Wait, uh, that are just to, your, just to your yeah. right, right here. So enjoy them and very happy birthday. Maybe we can sing her a quick happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jan. Happy birthday to you. And cupcakes from Delilah's Bakery in Echo Park. And uh, Mr. Wesson, we uh, we have held number 18 on the desk, and that's the, all that's left. So uh, okay, I you, think Miss Perry may want to. We have uh, cards for the public. Wanna... Um, Parks, Rosendahl, and I think both of you called. All, everybody wanted to call that special. Should we go to the public hearing first? If there's no yeah. objection, yeah. we'll go ahead and do that. Um, so with that, I'd like to invite forced, uh, forward uh, Lee Harris is our first speaker, and then uh, we'll go from there to the next yeah, one. Um, members of the council, I'm not Lee Harris, I'm Jerry Silva, but the group agreed to let me go first because I wanted to address you about the public opinion poll um, based on the public in California's position on the three strikes law. And hopefully you have it in front of you. If not, you'll have it soon enough. Um, the reason I bring this to your attention is because we have from residents in the city of California the city, the state of California, 70% support for amending the three strikes law. We've been after you more or less for a year and a half to give us your ear. Hopefully some of you, I have your ear. I see some of you are listening. I appreciate that. I definitely appreciate Councilwoman Perry, Councilman Wesson, and Councilperson Rosendahl. I don't know if he's here. There he is. For bringing this to your attention, I thank you for hearing us. Please, on behalf of our members, on behalf of over 4,000 nonviolent prisoners, most of them drug addicts, we all know drug addiction, we have it in our family, these are the poor ones serving life sentences under California's three strikes law. It's considered inhumane by just about everyone. We've got five parents here. We've lost some of our members in this fight. This is a difficult, difficult battle, and we hope that we get your approval today. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lee Harris? Is Lee Harris here? After that, it will be Lydia um, Jen Jenkin. Is that right? Yep. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Lee Harris, and my son's name is um, Cornelius Harris, and uh, he's in prison. Um, uh, what's the name? Uh, in Central City, uh, Pelican Bay. And uh, he's in there for uh, drugs. Um, he, uh, I, I don't know why the lawyer said he wasn't fit for society. I do not know why, but he's in there for drugs, and I'm here to, um, mm. for you to let him go, okay? Um, mm. that's it. That's all I got to say. Thank you very much, Ms. Harris. Uh, L Lydia, uh... And after that will be uh, Jolene S Scott. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Lydia Jordan, and I'm a teacher with Los Angeles County Schools Office of Education. I work with uh, at-risk youth, alternative education. I spoke with you about a year ago about the impact that this is having on the youth. They're angry, they're distrustful. It's just a devastating thing for the youth and to our community. And I'd like to share <coughs> some reasons for you to support this resolution. There's economic and taxes. It cost about $43,300 to keep a, a prisoner for a year. There's 60,000 to 55, to 85 rather, a year per prisoner over 55 years old. They age and they have all kinds of 
health problems that we have to address. It costs an additional 15000 a year to put a child of a prisoner in foster care. Cost about 113000 to build new prison beds for each prisoner. There are better alternatives. The RAND Corporation <coughs> has done several studies, and they have, uh, there's a concession that um, crime would decrease three to four times as much three to four times if additional monies were spent on drug rehab programs rather than prisons. This law targets the poor, why white collar criminals basically get off free, given the current climate today with the Paris Hilton fiasco. We can see the injustice and the unfairness. And I urge you to vote yes on this resolution in the interest of honesty and integrity and all of the above. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Ms. Jordan. Um, I'm s sorry if I didn't get the pronunciation right. Is it Jolene Scott? Is that right? Yes. Okay, please. My name is Geraldine Scott. Oh, Geraldine, I have a s and my son is in prison. And I am a member of FACTS. And the FACTS family is very outraged that the government and legislative leaders behind closed doors committed this, the United States taxpayers to over $7 billion, $15 billion including debt service to expand California's out of control prison system. Both houses of the legislature suspended the Constitution to vote on AB 900 with no advance notice, no public hearing or even any actual language and print prior to the vote. We are appalled that this failed system will now be expanded by 53,000 more beds, 40,000 in state prisons, and 13,000 in county jails. We question this, whether representative government exists in California at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Laura Dominguez Frisbee. Hello, my name is Laura Frisbee. I'm out of Orange County, but born in Whittier, California. I'm an author, publisher, a family guide to visiting California State Prison. I feel this law that we're going, excuse me, but the city resolution, I think you guys should all sign it. It's very important, especially when you have a lot of Hollywood, quote unquote, getting felonies now. One of them is going to get struck out with three, and it's going to take us much longer. Then you have, right now, Arnold wants you guys to get all the nonviolent and the ones that are going to be released to fill up your prisons again. So I think it's important that you guys vote on this because sooner or later it's going to be taxpayers. As is, we're wasting taxpayers' money today in front of Paris Hilton's house with all the police. I was in Orange County this past week and we had a guy that had, um, he didn't go to court and so the judge gave him $500 fine because he didn't, he had two warrants. He lost his job, and it seems like they don't care, but if you're rich, then you guys care. But I hope that you guys will sign this resolution because it will help families throughout the state of Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you very much. Margaret Ibarra is our next speaker. After that will be Linda Ward. Okay, I'm here as a senior citizen, a grandmother that was raising three grandchildren that had been with me for eight years. I got one of my childs here. And my son went for the three strikes, had been clean for seven years, and he went on domestic violence where there was no violence. It was just bickering because she was on drugs. And uh, all these children are left behind. I already got a 14-year-old boy, a very troubled boy, being raised without a father and a mother. Because the mother abandoned them after my son got sentenced. She felt very guilty. And uh, this law has to change. We have to make this a law where it's fair, not the balance that we are taking, the road we're taking for all these nonviolent people that are going to prison for so many years and leaving families behind. I'll be 76 years old Sunday, and I'm raising these children. How much longer can I take care of them? All these children, I'm not the only one. There's a lot of grandmothers like me out there. This law has to change. These are people that because they did minor things, they're doing a life sentence, 25 to life, 35 to life. 
It's just not justice. Like she was saying, the Paris girl can get out, but our kids can't for something minor. So please try to help us and vote on this for all the children that are being left behind. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Ward is our next speaker. Linda Ward. After that will be Seal Sorensen. Good morning, everyone. Um, I've been here several times. Um, once again, I'm here because my son is serving a life sentence because he had a medical problem, which is drugs. And I feel that the judge should have sent him to a drug program as opposed to sending him to prison for the rest of his life. It is cruel and unusual punishment. Um, I, just, I just know within my heart that it's, it's not fair. It's very unfair to treat another human being the way my son is being treated and 4,000 other young men and women are being treated like animals because they had a drug problem or a mental problem and they're in prison serving life like they've committed a crime, robbed somebody, raped somebody, murdered somebody. They've done none of that. They simply have a drug problem and they need help. Thank you. Thank you. Seal Sorensen is our next speaker. Seal Sorensen. No? What, did you, what was the name? Seal Sorensen. My name is Seal Sorensen from Granada Hills. Uh, I'd want to address the stupidity of the economics of, of this bill. If the funds were taken, that go into building the jails. Now we're sending people out of state. Uh, the, the endless, endless cost of, 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 of this bill, if it were put into building uh, schools, training, uh, job training, uh, creating jobs, all the things that are necessary to, to avoid the problems that arise uh, because of this stu uh, money not available for the true causes that we, that, that we should be facing. We are destroying the lives of young people by putting them into jail. They're not being trained. They're, not, they're coming out into the world at, with records and, and uh, have problems going on and, make, and, and, and creating their lives for beneficial things. We must use just plain old common sense and, and get back to, uh, get back to um, a, 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 a real uh, a objective uh, answer to what, what we need here. We don't need more jails. We need training. We need, we need jobs and, and, uh, come and not sending people, filling the jails up uh, with with young people whose lives are being destroyed by this process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Gloria Watkins. Gloria Watkins. After that will be Bill Grant. Good morning. My name is Gloria Watkins and I'm a member of FACTS, which is Families to Amend the California Three Strike Law. I represent my son, who is a nonviolent, unjustly incarcerated three striker, and the other 4,299 4, approximately people through, uh, who are doing three strikes who cannot speak for themselves. I truly believe that the money could be better spent in rehabilitation and training and job training, things that could prepare them for the streets. We are all doing time by paying taxes to maintain the 4,300 that I spoke of. I am speaking out for it is part, past time for this law to become a thing of the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bill Grant is our next speaker. After that is Donna Warren. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Bill Grant, 
and I'm from the city of Inglewood. And I want to first say that if this three strikes law continue in the form that it is, the most detrimental thing that's going to happen is that it's going to bankrupt all of us in this state of California. It's estimated that it costs $1.2 million to keep a person in prison during a 25 to life prison term. And that is a shame because it does not do anything to prevent or deter crime. It has no rehabilitation value. And most important is that if they continue with it, they're going to have legislation that's in process now to build 53,000 more prison beds at a cost of $5.7 billion to the taxpayers. And we can't afford it anymore. Uh, the kids like to say, are we stuck on stupid? Well, I don't know what we're stuck on with this idiotic bill. Uh, with this idiotic three strikes bill, but I know we need to get unstuck on it. And Council uh, Member Perry, happy birthday to you, and uh, many more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Donna Warren is next. After that, we'll Nell Ivory. Hello, Council. Thank you so much for allowing me and for my organization, Families to Men California's Three Strikes, to speak to you today. I appreciate Jan Perry, Bill Rosendahl, and uh, Herb Wesson for advancing us so that you can hear us. Uh, my name's Donna Warren. I am a proud member of FACTS, Families to Men California's Three Strikes, and I was the Green Party candidate for Lieutenant Governor in 2006. One of my main uh, issues was amending the Three Strikes Law. Uh, very quickly, I want to thank all these beautiful people to my left who came today, and I want to thank the central, two members of the Central Committee of the Green Party, Syl Sorensen and Francis Wells, for being here today, and they're also members of FACTS. My son died in 1997 because of the drug war in my community. Today, hundreds are dying alive in California's prisons, and in some cases in private prisons outside of California. I'm asking the Consul today to help the community stop the outrageousness of the Three Strikes Law and direct resources to the community where they belong, health care, jobs, education, and homes, not prisons. Presently, there are over 4,000 nonviolent offenders doing life under California's three strikes law at a cost of 43,600 per prisoner per year. And someone told you 1.2 million over 25 years. Amending three strikes will not only alleviate the current overcrowding in California's prisons, it will tell the people of California that we are all worthy of God's love. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nelly Ivory. After that will be Luis Garcia. Yes, I'm Nell Ivory. And I know most of all of you. I've been in California since 1945. I'm 83 years old and I've seen all this change. I'm appalled at especially the governor did to our three strikes. We didn't ask for the rapists and the murderers and all that to be out of prison. We asked for the people that was had drugs problems and all of that and as you know in all of y'all's community you it's affecting the children the schools the community and the families it's they're being destroyed what are these children going to do and the children are our future all of you all and we will be gone in a few years being infected because we'll be too old and now we want you to help us amend these three strikes. One thing I would like to say, I'm old enough to know when Hitler went into Germany and destroyed all those people. That's, that's what I feel that I'm in California under Hitler's law. And I'm very, 
very angry and disappointed and hurt about it because I work in the schools. I work for LAUSD. Now I volunteer in all the schools. I volunteer to help the young people on the street. They don't have no hope. You can give them hope by giving them justice. If somebody do, if I run a red light, give me a ticket. If I do something, give me a ticket according to what I did. Don't set me up. And make me pay 25 years for life for nothing that I don't think they deserve. And I will help you if they deserve it. And I want all of you, and we're going to hold you responsible for helping us. You don't have to help us if you don't want to, and then we'll know who you are. But, and we're asking God to help us, and I hope you will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our last speaker is Luis Garcia. Thank you, members of the City Council. My name is Luis Garcia. I'm a member of FACS, Families to Amend California Three Strikes. I'm also co-chair of the Senate Select Community Committee on California's Correctional System, and I'm a 30-year uh, Deputy Probation Officer of the Los Angeles County Probation Department. I want to first commend the City Council leaders who brought this resolution to the City Council, and I urge the whole City Council to pass this resolution. It is very needed at this time. As a member of a profession in law enforcement, a lot of members of law enforcement now realize that a law such as the three strikes has only resulted in the, the filling up of the prisons to the point where the taxpayers are objecting. It's a financial disaster. And as Sheriff Baca was quoted in the newspapers, that a jail experience or a prison experience should be a corrective experience, not a punishing one or one that punishes the, the taxpayers. And that's exactly what's not happening with the correctional system at this time. There's a lot going on in the prison reform uh, situation in the state, and your resolution will go a long way towards helping to relieve the overcrowding conditions in prison, which are cruel and unusual punishment in and, in and of themsel themselves. Para los residentes de Los Ángeles que hablan español, mi nombre es Luis García. Estoy aquí urgiendo a este concejal y urjo a todos los, los residentes que hablen a sus uh, representantes de esta mesa de concejal que voten para esta resolución para que se cambie la ley de tres strikes. Esta ley nos ha afectado a nuestra comunidad muy desproporcionalmente y es muy injusta y cruel. Resulta en, en muchos años de prisión por delitos que no se merecen tanto tiempo en prisión. Y por eso es muy urgente que llamen a estos concejales para que se cambie esta ley y para que pase esta resolución. Gracias. Thank you. That closes our public hearing on this item. We thank everybody for that. I'd like to recognize the maker of the motion pursuant to council rules. The committee chair, uh, it's been waved out, so second precedence goes to the maker of the motion, and that is Jan Perry. Um, and after that, uh, Mr. Parks, did you want to be heard on this? Uh, but afterwards, did you want to be heard? Okay. And as calling special, Mr. Parks will be next, then Mr. Zine and Mr. Rosendahl. Ms. Perry. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, under the current three strikes law, only the first two strikes have to meet the definition of a violent or serious felony uh, conviction. Uh, however, the third strike can be a non-serious or non-violent uh, person having one previous serious or violent felony conviction serves twice the term otherwise required under law for any new felony conviction, not just a serious or violent felony. So a person who had two or more previous serious or violent felony convictions ends up serving a term of 25 years to life for any new felony conviction. The intent of this law is not being realized when a person is sentenced to 25 years to life for a petty theft crime such as shoplifting. As the, as the three strikes law is currently written uh, clearly, it needs to be corrected, amended, adjusted, so that punishment does fit the crime. And I hope that uh, all of you will vote yes on this item. And I believe Mr. Park, Parks is going to clarify even further uh, this uh, language that needs to be reinserted. Thank you. Mr. Parks. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to ask the CLA to come up on one issue to clarify, uh, just so I have a better understanding. There was a comment made earlier about uh, the drug issue and how many people are going to prison. I was under the impression Prop 36 kind of diverted that issue in another plane. Is that still impacted on, on three strikes? Michael Karsh with the Legislative Analyst Office. The 
Uh, Proposition 36 is one of the about the only exception that has been carved into the three strikes law. Okay, but it, but it gives an option of yes. not prison time but That's, treatment. Yes. Even if it's the third strike would have yes. would have been the third strike in the past. Yes. So the the because I thought we solved that by supporting 36 years ago that we did not want to fill the jail system up with people that yes, are sir. are really impacted by a disease versus a criminal act and that was yes, I think sir. what 36 was. Yes. Okay. The one, the one thing uh colleagues and I think it's uh, probably well overdue that uh uh and I think when we were in the era of three strikes uh it was something that got on a on a train and, and was unstoppable uh although 30 years ago as a police officer I used to handle a detail at Wilshire that dealt with petty with a prior so we have had career criminal statutes on the books for decades the, the so I think it is a need to amend it because I think there's been a lack of discretion by some prosecutors who have gone across the board saying any felony crime fits the three strikes and I think the one thing that harms good law is bad decisions and so it needs to be amended uh, but one of the things I was going to ask in the SB 1642 that Ms. Romero or Senator Romero came forward with a couple of years ago and I think it was also part of the initiative uh, and going before the public and wasn't enough to get all of the signatures or not the signatures but all the votes there was a phrase placed in her legislation that basically said that we would not deal with nonviolent or minor felonies as a third strike and there was a phrase that said unless the defendant had a violent criminal history and that's not in this issue or this motion and my concern is, is that was one of the parts that I thought basically was agreeable by most people that monitor the criminal justice system, that this was not a free pass for someone who has had a history of, vi of violence, that they would get a free pass as it relates to a non-violent crime that they happen to be arrested for. Is, is, would you, are you aware of whether that was part of the initiative that the, that was put before the state of California? Both the initiative and the Romero bill did recognize that people with a violent past with okay. violent felonies. Okay. Would be and what we're doing today is a motion not necessarily addressing a specific piece of legislation. We're putting ourselves on record of what we think the amendments are a, if a law should be put together, this is what we believe we should support. That's correct. If it is, if it is similar to 1642. Okay. The, the only thing that I would want to make sure is that if it's similar to 1642, that we ensure that the language of unless a defendant has a violent criminal past, that we not lose that phrase uh, as part of 1642. Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Zine is our next speaker. Thank you. Can you give me a definition, violent or serious? Is there a definition in the code, what would be considered a violent or serious crime? A technical definition. Because I have not been able to find that in the documents that I have. And I'm thinking of, of grand theft list. auto, I'm thinking of robbery, I'm thinking of rape, I'm thinking of domestic violence, I'm thinking of all these different which individuals may interpret as violent or serious, but it doesn't give a definition of violent or serious, it just refers to violent or serious, and people would ask the question, unless we specifically state robbery with a gun, a robbery with a knife, a robbery through force or fear, because robbery can be carried out through force or fear. How do we define violent or serious? In the committee analysis on um, the Dimely bill, they list 33 crimes which are considered um, third strike enhancements, but which are not serious or violent. So how do we then come up with a description if we're talking about the issue uh, you've got the first two strikes must meet the definition of a violent or serious felony conviction, and the third can be non-serious or non-violent. How do we make the distinction between violent or serious and non-violent or serious? If someone comes up to rob me 
and they're, they're, they're seven feet tall, and I'm in fear because of their height and their weight, and they don't have any weapon, give me your money, and I'm in fear for my life, even though they haven't displayed a weapon, is that considered violent or serious? But it's only their mere presence, not that they have a weapon. And so that's the concern I have, is mm -hmm. how do we define violent or serious? Or is it interpreted differently by different people, and then we have more of a problem where um, the catch-22 appears. And I don't have a problem with what uh, District Attorney Cooley tried to do mm -hmm. a couple years ago. I'm just looking at clouding this even more where there's less definition and more controversy and more analysis to say, if we enumerate murder, rape, robbery, uh, grand theft auto, whatever, those are serious or violent felonies. But when we don't give the specific crimes, we leave it to individual interpretation, and the description I give you of an individual comes up, uh, we have some uh, senior citizens here. If I go up to you and say, give me your money because of my size and because of my voice and my tone, you're in fear, you give me your money out of fear, and there's no weapon displayed, is that considered a violent or serious crime because they're frightened because of my brute size? So they're saying, no, that's not. Mm -hmm. But the law would describe that as a robbery, force or fear. And they're saying, no, that's not force or fear. Well, you know what? The law says force or fear is considered robbery when you're taking someone's goods. So how do we then define the violent or serious part of this that we're trying to modify? Okay, there are six uh, examples given. Murder would obviously be one of those. Vehicular homicide while intoxicated. Lewd acts with a child under the age of 14. Sexual penetration, oral copulation, or sodomy with a child under 14 years of age who is 10 years younger than the defendant. A sexually violent prior offense. And any serious or violent felony offense punishable by life imprisonment or death. So they limit it to a very small number of crimes, which is, I think we need to have a, a clear description to say what is the definition of violent or, or serious. I understand the sex crimes that you enumerated, DUI um, with a death or murder, obviously, would be considered violent or serious. But some of those other categories that are in the penal code, which there's hundreds of sections in the California vehicle, uh, California vehicle and penal code. The what? Traffic cop. Uh, DUI. Is DUI considered serious or violent? No. It is if someone dies. What if someone's seriously injured but not killed in a an intoxicated driving collision or under the influence of drugs. Someone's involved in a collision under the influence of drugs. Someone is injured, seriously injured, in a coma. Would that be considered serious or violent or is it just a collision? Those are some of the descriptions that we need to identify so we don't end up weakening what we really need to incarcerate people who've committed serious and violent crimes versus those that go out and commit a shoplift and then they get sentenced to 25 years. And I don't support the shoplifter going to jail for 25 years but you see the, where I'm coming from? It, it's, it's very cloudy, and I'm trying to come up with a definition or some description so we will have some cover since the California District Attorneys Association is opposing what is being proposed, and they're the ones who prosecute these cases. The District Attorney of L.A. County, I understand, supports it. Prop 36 is already an out for people who have two serious convictions, and the third or fourth or fifth is drugs. There's a diversion program through Prop 36. But how do we end up satisfying the California District Attorneys Association, which are our prosecutors in California, at the same time do what's right for the people? That, I, I, I don't want to go against it, but I think there's unresolved issues that we need to come up with and maybe add some more definition to this for the benefit of the people of the state of California and to say we can support it. And you're the man. So what do you suggest? I have, uh, well, I've read to you what has been provided in the committee analysis on the issue. But do we need to enhance that? Do you enhance that for the benefit of the folks? And I respect the fact that they're all here. Some of them have relatives who are serving a long time in jail. Mm -hmm. uh, so I respect it to the time they're here. But at the same time, how do we plan this for the future? And the governor wants to build more prisons. And at the same time, 
we need to do something so we're going to have something that's not clouded. And I know that there's been a couple of attempts in the past, and I think that uh, in 2006, Senate Bill uh, 1642 uh, didn't work, and then District Attorney Cooley's measure didn't work. Uh, so They were both identical. Well, he tried to, did he try to copy that? Yes. Uh, and it didn't I'm work. I'm not sure which one came out first, but Cooley did have his initiative on the books, and he, co he was listed as a co-sponsor of Gloria Romero's bill. And, and the, the association, California District Attorneys, were opposed, and they're still yes. opposed, I understand. And they're still opposed. Who else is opposed besides the California DA's Association? No, that's the only one I'm aware of. There's no one else opposed to so law enforcement uh, there, in general? I think the uh, Police Protective League was also opposed to it. I see. I, I don't want to be opposed to it, but I, I think that if we don't put some definition and to clarify, mm -hmm. it'll create more problems, and we need to have that certainty mm -hmm. so it doesn't create more I'll problems. I'll be glad to work with you, with your office on that. And come okay. Up with some if we can do that, as, as we send this forward, if we can put something in there to have this clear definition mm -hmm. and define violent and serious, because I think the sex crimes, everyone's going to go agree, but there may be some other crimes, such as what I talk about, the robbery, just because of an individual size, uh, would not be with a weapon, but it's mm -hmm. still considered a robbery under the law, not be considered serious or violent, which, in fact, a robbery is a robbery. It's different than a burglary or a theft, mm -hmm. when someone's actually taking something from your property under force or fear. So I think that if we can add that as a friendly amendment, that we would make a definition of violent or serious, because I think the description that have been cited, it's very limited in scope when we're talking about the violent and serious, the description that uh, have been read. Is there any objection to that amendment? If there is any and we could then bring that back to come up with, come up with those categories we're talking about, violent and serious, have some description, of definition of violent and serious versus the way it is now. If you look at what's been cited, it's very, very slim. Murder, vehicle manslaughter, and sex acts with children. Mm -hmm. I mean, that basically is what they're talking about. And I think it has to be, I as I stated, some of these other... Um, what about kidnapping? Is kidnapping considered... And Mr. Uh, Sir, Mr. Time, about six minutes over, so... Okay, okay. I, 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 would just, I would just ask that... Six minutes over. Before we send the final version forward, uh, we have some description. I'll be more than happy to work okay. to help make this happen with any of my colleagues. I think it's that we want to support it, but we want to make sure that those areas are covered and not get clouded more. We're, we'll hold that'd that be, on the desk. We'll hold the amendment on the desk. I think a couple people have raised concerns just of clarification. We'll give them the chance to talk okay. about that. That's fine. Mr. Okay. Rosendahl is next, and then Mr. Wesson, and then Mr. Alarcon. No. Mr. Rosendahl. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate that. Uh, just as a personal privilege, I would like to ask Jerry Silver to come up to that mic there and please help us understand what just went on, not just with Mr. Zine, but what you heard before that. Thank you so very much. Um, the issue, well, first, if I do have a minute, I'd like to speak to Councilperson Parks. The issue with Prop 36, I'm, and we're sorry, extremely you, happy for it. Can I, I do that I, or not? If you can just address direct directly. Person, but you yeah. can say what was discussed and what you heard, okay? And, okay. Uh, in the discussion of Prop 36, just to make that real clear, uh, in order to qualify for Prop 36 um, as a person who has been arrested with a simple drug possession, you had to have been conviction-free for five years. A person who is a drug addict likely won't be conviction free for five years. We're extremely happy about it, but it didn't quite go far enough. But it's, it's better than nothing. But the other problem with Prop 36 is we've got a lot of folks here whose people were convicted of simple drugs possession, but that was before the passage of Prop 36. As a result, they'll be in prison for the rest of their lives. They won't come out because Prop 36 is not retroactive. Um, in respect to the other discussion about uh, clearly defining serious and violent, they are very clearly defined in terms of a person, of, of what they are in the code. And I think you probably know because, you know, the police officers that are on the council, sorry, I don't mean to speak to anybody, know that there are codes, it's what, 1120 and 667 or something, that define serious and violent crimes. All, robbery is always a, seri a violent crime. I don't care if I go up to, a, to Mr. Rosendahl that's six foot tall and I'm five foot and I say, give me your money, that's a robbery, that's a violent crime. That counts as a strike. On the third strike, that's the issue that we're dealing with and that we're asking to be dealt with in this resolution. On the third strike, 
We're saying it can be, or no, in the third strike, the actuality is it can be any felony, shoplifting, simple drug possession, receiving stolen property. Clearly, it can't be robbery, because that's a violent offense. So you get, we're not asking to change the law, um, at least at this stage, um, to allow people to commit robberies to be uh, resentenced or to not go down for 25 years. Robbery is a violent crime. We respect that. So if you commit a robbery, you get 25 years to life. If you commit a petty theft, you don't. Now, in terms of the prior offenses, and I think that's what the gentleman was reading here, what uh, 1642 and Cooley's bill both contain, and Cooley introduced his bill before Senate Bill 1642. Uh, she introduced her bill as a way to get Cooley's bill through, because by the time Cooley introduced his bill, it was too late to get signatures. And he knew that. He was hoping to get a Senate bill. Uh, and also, to be clear, Prop 66 came very close to passing. People in California do want this law changed. We need to know that. But in terms of his bill and Romero's bill, what they said is, and this speaks to something else that was raised, is not anybody with a violent past, but a person who had rape, murder, or child molestation defined the way this gentleman did um, up at the table, those people would not be eligible for resentencing. It, it was not the blanket language a person with his violent past, because I could be considered to have a violent past if I committed three robberies. I could commit them at a five foot tall and, you know, on drugs, and I say, give me your money. Not really an act of violence, an act of desperation. So that, in terms of what, what, what is being, I think, proposed here, which is being asked, you're, at, you're being asked to sign a resolution like Romero's bill. That would limit the people to be resentenced to those with murder, rape, child molestation, and some of the uh, things that this gentleman raised. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. I really appreciate your time. It's hard for me to listen to things where I think people don't have it clear, so thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Silver. And thank you, Mr. President, for letting me have that privilege to, to let her to come up. What we want to do is the right thing, and we need to know and understand what's really going down. And Senator Gloria, Gloria Romero is an incredible leader um, who is focusing on this issue. Our colleagues, look, uh, let me ask you this question, uh, Mr. Kirsch. Yes. How many people are in prison uh, in the state of California? I don't know. How many of them in prison are in there for drug use, abuse, or sale? I don't know the number. It's a lot. Okay. Well, those are the two big questions that he should know, frankly, the answers to, because there's 7.7 .7 million people in the criminal justice system in the United States of America. 2.2 .2 million are incarcerated. I am told over 50% of those in prison are there for drug use, abuse, or sale, or anything to do with the drug issue. The drug laws were created in the 80s. They are bad laws, period. Some people in California were smart enough to put 215 on the ballot that talked about medicinal use of marijuana. There are people in prison for smoking a joint and they're thrown away for life. It's the third felony, and they're sitting in prison. These are bad laws. We should treat drug use and abuse as a health issue. We should tie it to addiction issues where it can be treated. We should release these people from prison. Instead of building more prisons in this great country, we should be building more schools, we should be building more hospitals, we should be building more treatment centers. The problem is politicians are afraid to say this about the drugs because it's, it's considered soft on crime. No, no, no. What we're doing is creating a criminal industrial system. You know, the prison guards have more influence over this than anybody else, and that is wrong. Folks, it's just so frustrating to see young African Americans, one out of three young African American males, go through the criminal justice system. Many of them for these petty drug laws that are bad laws to begin with, and they're thrown away, their lives are ruined. They get the stamp on the head called felon. Then they come out of prison, they can't find jobs, they can't find work, they can't get their life together because those laws have stamped them with this incredible insanity. We don't 
don't even have enough opportunity now so that the federal government can grow the marijuana, check the health issues, because they've made it such a serious thing, and they've made everybody scared in the political process about the war on drugs. The war on drugs is a war on people. It is not the right strategy. So if we want to be fundamental here, we need to revisit the drug laws on the federal level. I know Maxine Waters has been very strong on this over and over and over again. We need leadership in Washington. We need these presidential candidates to start focusing on the war on drugs and say we have created more prisons, put more people in the criminal justice system than any other country on earth. Let's get the facts straight. We're 5 percent of the world's population and we have 25 percent of the world's incarceration Restoration. We're supposed to be a democracy? That kind of action has destroyed especially African-American young men and to some degree others, but basically African-Americans get nailed and it makes no sense at all. So this is a step in the right direction. Obviously the third strike should have nothing to do uh, with these kinds of felonies, putting people in prison for the rest of their lives. And we need to make it only for violent, violent, violent rape and pillage and those kinds of things. To hear those Mothers speak about their sons and their grandsons and their children. It's the most unbelievable story I've heard here today. And I just want to thank you all for standing up for what needs to happen, which is changing the laws and letting your young men out of prison and let them become productive members of society. Bless you all for that. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Rosendahl. And um, the statistics you asked for, it's 171,000 um, folks who are in California prisons right now, and about 40% uh, of them are there for drug offenses now. Mr. Wesson. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. President and members. Uh, be before I, in detail or semi-detail, address this issue, I want to thank our, our colleague, Greg Smith, who's not here for allowing this to be waived out of committee so that we could have this much needed debate. I also want to thank the members from FACTS for coming out today and it's, it's good to see you and thank Jan Perry for her leadership. I think Chief Parks touched on it earlier in, in his uh, remarks when he talked about this this whole concept came at a time when individuals, individuals like us in particular, in elected office, were accused of being soft on crime. So we then came up with this tough, tough on crime, which had merit, but people didn't look three steps ahead and see the unintended consequences. So when I was in the assembly and Tony Cardenas was in the assembly and Richard was in the Senate, I believe each and every one of us voted in one form or another for some amendment to this law. Unfortunately, we were unsuccessful because it takes a, a two-third vote in the, the, the legislature. I say that to say, to go back to, to my dear friend Dennis Zine's point, you raise some good points. Well, you. you really, really do. But members, on this council floor, we will not craft this legislation. We will not write it nor will we dot the I's, nor will we cross the T's. It is our responsibility, if we believe that this is wrong, and listening to those of you around this horse show, horseshoe, I believe, horse show sometimes, dog show. We'll correct the record, don't worry. Horseshoe. I believe that we feel that changes need to be made. So the best thing that we can do is send a message to Sacramento that says, change it. Change it. They are the ones that are going to have to write the whereases and wherefores and what have you. Dennis, I understand, and we could sit up here and debate what is violent and what is not, and in my opinion, it has no effect when it goes up to Sacramento. What might have an effect is the greatest city in the world, the biggest city in the state, saying to the legislature, this is wrong, fix it. We trust you to fix it. I could live with a judge having the discretion. They're handcuffed. And they can't 
give the kinds of sentences that are fair. Like Dennis referenced some big guy towering over some small scene. A, a judge would have all of those facts. <laughs> hey, give but, me your money. Give me your money. <laughs> I may be small, but I'm wiry. And I have knocked out, I have knocked out guys bigger than you. Not with my fist, but usually I pick up something that's an equalizer. So you, you can hop over here, but you might limp back, okay? <laughs> anyway, the point, the point that I'm trying to make, the point that I'm trying to make is that we need to make it crystal clear in Sacramento that we're asking for help. And we need to afford them the opportunity to do whatever is necessary to get the votes. Two-third votes in the, the, the assembly is 54 votes. That is a very difficult thing to do. In the Senate, what is it, Richard, 27? Yes. 20, you forgot you've been away that long? 26? Two-thirds majority. That's difficult. The worst thing that we can do is to vote on a resolution that restricts what the legislature can do. So even though I'm sympathetic to concerns and issues that were raised, I think the important thing for us is to send the message to the state capitol that we are supportive of some fair and equitable change. So with that said, I would ask my colleagues for an I vote. Let's not put a lot of whereases and handcuffs on this, because at the end of the day, whatever we send there is not going to be what's voted on, Dennis. I just think that what we want to do is afford Gloria and afford the other legislatures, the other legislators, the opportunity to do what they have to do to put something on the governor's desk. And lastly, even with that said, it's a very tough call. Rod Wright, a dear friend of ours, carried legislation. We all supported it. It didn't go. Jackie Goldberg, uh, Mervyn Dimely, this is a very tough issue because some people feel if they vote for this, they will be soft on crime and they will not be elected to anything. And I get that and I'm sympathetic to it, but in order to lead, we have to get to the front of the line. Los Angeles colleagues, let's get to the front of the line. Mr. Alacon is our next speaker, then Mr. Reyes and Ms. Perry for a second time. <laughs> I'll make it short because... Uh... Speaker Wesson uh, covered much of the ground that I wanted to cover. Uh, the fact of the matter is that in order for this measure to get out of the legislature and on the governor's desk, many Republicans have to support it. And I think their concerns will be um, much more direct and specific than those raised by Mr. Zine. Uh, so uh, the words of, of Mr. Wesson are, are very prominent here uh, because we cannot uh, craft this legislation here. What, what we must trust is not so much that, uh, that the, uh, the Democratic majority in the legislature will write a bill that would uh, raise every concern that Mr. Zine raises, uh, but in fact we should know that the, the minority of, of Republicans who would have to vote for this uh, would raise those concerns very, uh, very eloquently and, and in greater detail. And so I think that it's clear that the vast majority of Californians want to revamp this law to exclude those who have committed crimes that are not serious or violent. Now, what that uh, conjures up in terms of one's uh, personal perspective versus what is actually the law uh, is, has been a stumbling block for uh, the passage of the, the, the measure that went before the voters because they, they received the, the message in the way of public relations uh, consultants uh, uh, undermining uh, the true intent of the measure. Uh, and so the public, even though it went down, it didn't go down because the vast majority of people wouldn't want to exclude serious or violent offenders, but because of the messages that were conveyed during the course of the campaign. Um, but I think that this this measure is clear enough that it, it is consistent with the will of the voters. And as Mr. Wesson said, 
Uh, it will have further scrutiny in the legislature, and it's not going to get any looser. Uh, if anything, it's going to get tighter. Uh, and, and because of that, I would urge that uh, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying you trust the legislature, even though uh, I was just there a few minutes ago. Um, but, uh, but in this particular case, uh, there will be uh, significant scrutiny on, on this item. Uh, and should it get out of the legislature, I'm sure that it would be in the form that, uh, that uh, based on my uh, knowledge and, and personal relationships with each and every one of my colleagues, it would be in the form that, that each and every one of you uh, could support. Uh, so with that, I would urge your, your uh, support, and, uh, and let's create a California that is focused on eliminating violent offenders from our streets uh, and educating and re-educating those who have found themselves in, in, uh, in positions where they cannot control uh, their behavior without the assistance of society. Thank you, Mr. Alicorn. Our next speaker is Mr. Reyes. Uh, well, thank you, colleagues. I, I'm hearing this discussion, and I hear the passion of my colleague, Councilman Rosendahl, about the bad laws. And you ask yourself, how can a law be bad? And I personally can tell you that I know of a youngster whose father is addicted to drugs and had to actually commit a crime to get arrested because that's the only way he could get treatment. Because he has an illness, he's sick, he has an addiction. But now we find out that he might not live long. So his life sentence has already been granted to him. But other young people who are right now incarcerated, who are seeking some kind of medical help, some kind of drug treatment, but the DA and others would double their time because that's what the law requires. So now instead of four, six, eight years, we're doing 16, 32 years. Now we as elected officials, when I look at the composition of this body, this body would probably not be here in the 80s. If you look at the assembly and the change there, that body is changing. But it is not enough for us to say, this is the way the institution functions. And that I need to behave a certain way because I won't get elected if I try to change it. We should step up. We should be rallying our constituents who happen to be constituents of these assembly members and the senators and pressure them to make the change that allows us to understand that these are bad laws that we should be promoting language that speaks about health, not about crime, but health so they can prevent the crime. And perhaps channel those funds, the millions and millions of dollars we're contemplating to build more prisons, and instead move that money so we can change the dropout rate that currently exists in this great city. So colleagues, I support you, but I think this is time in which this institution, much like we went up to Sacramento and fought for, for more money for Department of Transportation and transit funds, we should be looking at how we use this institution to change those bad laws. And that's something that we should contemplate. It's something we should actually strategize, and it would be for the benefit of all of us to take it to that level and be that serious about the level of condemnation that's occurring to our youth, the African American community, Latino community, because these are the folks you find in these prisons. The majority of them are in these prisons for those bad laws. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Uh, Mr. Labange is next. Well, thank you very much. I just wanted to rise. Mr. Weston, thank you for your comments, and I hope we're on the same page here because I do support this reform. I do believe though I did uh, remember my early days I wanted to be a school teacher. There were no jobs. I coached high school football and in coaching football remember you had players and if players did jump off sides or make some minor infringements you taught them. You taught them to teach them how to play the game right. But if they did commit uh, horrendous penalties and didn't want to correct themselves and did harm to their team, they didn't play. 
no one was that uh, category at all. And what I'm saying is if people do hurt people in this community, they shouldn't be in our community. If they physically hurt people. But if they have challenges that there go, but for the grace of God go I, we should work with them in a different way to encourage them in a way that doesn't have this challenge. So as you mentioned, you give a wide spectrum there. I think as Mr. Reyes said, it is important to have that discussion. But I do think people who hurt people, they can't be on the team. People who hurt us in the community, physically, intimidate us as a community. There is a fear of crime, and that has to be dealt with throughout the state. But if anyone has the challenge of a, 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 uh, uh, drugs that take their mind and body away, it should be dealt with differently. They shouldn't be sent to an institution uh, that is there. And, uh, and if they have uh, uh, mental challenges, we should find a way. When I was in college, I spent every Thursday evening at Tascadero State Hospital uh, as part of a program at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo to help understand, deal with. And there's ways, but we forgot those ways because we would have said, as Mr. Parks told me in conversation, just said, well, boom, we'll just cut it all. You can't do that. We're a community, all of California, we've got to find a way. So I rise to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaBonge. And Ms. Perry is our next speaker. Thanks. This is my last comment, Mr. President. Um, you know, when we uh, do our jobs and embrace them fully and really understand the needs of our constituents, it's a few we have a rare opportunity here to create a balance and push things back in another direction. Many times when I'm, I'm uh, going to meetings in the southern part of my district and I see the huge numbers of young men on the corner during the day, nothing to do, often inebriated or worse, or even on Skid Row, which uh, is a story in and of itself. As many of the people there have been in and out of the uh, prison system uh, without uh, safety net, without uh, rehabilitation opportunities, uh, without the tools that they need to help them recover. And I think if we mean what we say here as a body, uh, this is an opportunity to uh, put another um, tool or another alternative back into the basket to work with so that we can help people get the help that they need and get them to recover and get them back to work and get them off the corners because having large numbers of people congregating anywhere with nothing positive to do uh, is uh, disrespectful to them as a group of people and disrespectful to ourselves that we would leave them behind. So I appreciate what everyone has said here today and uh, I'd like to take the vote now if there's no one after us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Perry, and thank everybody for the, their comments. That is the last speaker on the queue today. So with that, let's go ahead and open the roll. Uh, Mr. President, you still have Mr. Zine's motion on oh, yes. the table. Mr. Zine, what do you want to do on that? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and open the roll, as originally proposed. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. That is approved, and we will send that forthwith to the mayor. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your presence here, and congratulations. Thank you. Uh, next order of business. Council has motions for posting and referral. Those are posted and referred. Mr. Okay. Parks? Number 9 and 14 forthwith. Okay. That objection will send 9 and 14 forthwith as well. Uh, next order of business. There are excuses on the desk. Councilmember LeBond requests to be excused for the meetings of July 24th, 25th, and 31st for city business. A motion is required for the 25th. All right, I will move that, and Ms. Perry seconds without objection that those excuses will be granted. Council Member Zion requests be excused August 7th, 8th, and 10th for personal business. That meets council policy. All right, he is excused. Council Member Weiss requests be excused to leave, uh, excuse me, to arrive late on June 26th and for the entire meeting of July 24th for personal business. A motion is required. Okay, I will move that, and Ms. Perry seconds again without objection. So ordered. And Councilmember Grohl requests to be excused to leave at 11.45 on July 24th for city business and for the meetings of November 20th and 21st for personal business, all meet council policy. Those, are, those excuses are granted as well. And that does clear the desk. Announcements. Colleagues, now it's time for announcements. Mr. Rosendahl. Uh, yes, Mr. President. Uh, Sunday um, is Gay Pride Day in the city of Los Angeles. What that means is that gay people... Um, should have the same sense of self as straight people. And we've been marching for many years now because we are as good 
as normal and as healthy as straight people. It's our nature. Our nature comes from God. God makes no mistakes. So we're going to be out celebrating our existence. And many of you around the horseshoe will be with me um, on the fire truck, uh, uh, waving to the crowds, because you truly believe in the basic civil rights and human rights of gay people. We should have the same rights as everybody else. And we don't in this great country, I might add, when it comes to marriage, which are the rights of marriage, or to go into the military, or to go into some policing services. We still don't have our basic freedom as gay people. So we're going to be marching uh, for our freedoms and our rights, but also showing our pride and love of ourselves and the dignity of ourselves within ourselves. And I want to thank my colleagues that are going to be with me on the fire truck, and Bernard Parks will be in his own car, and the mayor will be in his own car, and Dennis Zine is going to have himself on a motorcycle, and he'll be there. But we're all going to be there be because himself. we all believe in one another, and I invite everybody to come to West Hollywood for an 11 o'clock parade, and then go to the, to the festival I afterwards. might be on the motorcycle with me. Thank Design, just for the record. Yep. Did you hear that? The president of the council is going to get on the back of the bike. Uh, right and, on, you know, Dennis Zine is going to wear his leather chaps. I don't know about that, Dennis. Uh, well, then, you, then maybe I, 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 I'd like to reconsider then. If but I, we're all God's children, and everybody should come and enjoy ourselves this weekend in West Hollywood. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mr. Rosendahl. Other announcements, colleagues? Yes, Mr. Alicorn. Members, uh, as you probably know by now, Silmar is a world... Uh, renowned site for hang gliding. And so uh, this su Saturday, June 9th, from 1 to 6 p.m., uh, the Silmar Hang Gliding Association will be uh, participating with the Chamber of Commerce in their mixer uh, for a Community Appreciation Day. They will be uh, having hang gliding. And I just wanted to express to my colleagues that uh, hang gliding is a wonderful experience. Uh, I've had the opportunity to do it on many occasions. And I, I should tell you that I've never done it by myself because you have to be trained uh, and go up at least uh, 10 times w b by a professional trainer. Uh, and I don't have the time as, as, as you to do that on a regular basis. Uh, but they will take you up with a, a trainer. So if you are interested, uh, I would be happy to donate $500 to any charity of your choice uh, for any council member that would uh, like to hang glide uh, in uh, Silmar and feature one of the more pleasant things about the Northeast San Fernando Valley. And I know that Mr. Wesson is going to take me up on that deal. Uh, and and uh, perhaps Mr. Zine, uh, and, uh, and I'd be happy to donate it might be to, difficult to the charity of your choice. So again, Zine. Saturday, June 9th from 1 to 6 p.m., uh, it will be at uh, 12600 Gridley Street in Silmar uh, at the north end of Gridley. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. LeBons and then Mr. Parks. Uh, thank you very much. On behalf of our colleague, Mr. Weezar, we invite everyone this weekend, Saturday, June 9th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. to come to Hollenbeck Park for the 6th Annual Resource Fair at the park. Hollenbeck Park is located, as you know, at just on East 4th Street at St. Louis. And uh, this year will uh, be a very special event with a variety of activities, uh, discussions, in, uh, informational booths uh, with uh, various organizations, including White Memorial Hospital, uh, Behavioral Health Services, Council District 4, and uh, the Department of Recreation and Parks. That's the sixth annual uh, resource fair for behavior health services at Hollenbeck Park. And also, members, I'd invite anyone to go visit the Los Angeles Zoo. It's a beautiful time of the year, and the uh, zoo is waiting for all visitors and enjoy its wide open. At the same time, visit the historic Maragon and Park Central for a great ride. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we have uh, a number of events in the 8th District. First one starting off, uh, we'll have the Baldwin Hills Relay for Life, which is the American Cancer Society sponsored program, starts Saturday, June the 9th, for an overnight event ending on June 10th, and that will be at the uh, Rancho Park from 9 a.m. on Saturday to, uh, to the evening on Sunday. Also, and that will be a number of entertainment and also information about the cancer. Also currently going on in the city of L.A., June 5th through the 10th is the annual Hollywood Black Film Festival. Over 120 films being shown at the, uh, uh, theater, the Music Hall Theater in Beverly Hills, uh, a fine arts theater. So that's something that has been an uh, annual event. We also have the Ward AME uh, Men's Day 
uh, which will be over this weekend, June 8th through 10th, uh, with a variety of programs, and that's at the uh, 1177 West 25th Street. Also, uh, in the 8th District, the uh, Arts Institute of California, 2900 uh, block of 31st Street. Uh, they're having their annual event in which their students are putting on their uh, products so that anyone interested in hiring them can come out and view it. And this will be done on June the 14th. And then we probably announced that our newest charter school, View Park Prep, will have its first graduation of 71 uh, seniors uh, at their uh, campus, and they, uh, well, they're going to have it at the Faithful Central Bible Church Tabernacle at 10 o'clock on June the 14th, and so that's the first graduation of that charter school, uh, and we'd ask the public to come out. Mr. Zahn. Thank you, Mr. President. A couple of the uh, matters taking place this weekend that uh, some may be interested in participating we have um, on Saturday at 8.30, Fallen Heroes Memorial Poker Run, which is a motorcycle run. And it's going to be at Old 27, 1355 North Coenga in Hollywood. And if you have a motorcycle, come on by. It's a fun event with the L.A. City Fire Department. Also, on Saturday at 9 o'clock, Canoga Park Community Pride Day. And uh, they are going to be doing a pride cleanup in Canoga Park. Also, on uh, Saturday, that's it for Saturday. Sunday, there is a, in addition to the West Hollywood Parade, 95th birthday party of Canoga Park All-American City. And that's going to take place at 7248 Owens Mouth in Canoga Park. And the Valley Youth Conference is going to hold their annual barbecue, Birmingham High School, at 3.30 on Sunday. And that's events that people may want to participate in. Thank you. This will be an exciting, fun weekend. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cardenas. Thank you very much. Uh, my office, along with the Department of uh, Public Works, is inviting everyone to come out to our LIDA for Environmental Awareness Day, where we're going to have recycling of bulky items, uh, collection, community cleanup in general, graffiti removal, treat planning projects, used oil collection and recycling sites, and uh, free giveaways, and much more. Again, uh, tomorrow it will start at 8 a.m. at Branford Park, which is 13306 Branford Street in Arlita and we'll have a barbecue at about 11.30 there at the park. In addition to that, people can meet at Beachy Elementary School, Canterbury Elementary School, Sharp Elementary School, Vena Elementary School, Arlita High School, and Branford Park. Uh, the actual cleanup will kick off at about eight, between 8 and 8.30 tomorrow in the community of Arlita. So everyone is welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Cardenas. Uh, also, this weekend in uh, Glassell Park, Cypress Park, I know Mr. Uh, Reyes, myself, uh, Mr. Weezer are sponsoring a great uh, Cypress Park, Glassell Park walkabout in which we are walking the different blocks of the uh, neighborhood to try to increase and enhance pedestrian-friendly streets. Uh, 8.30 we'll be meeting uh, to begin that, so please join us. Uh, at 7.15 in the uh, evening, the annual uh, Dyke March will be happening in uh, Silver Lake starting at Fountain and Sunset. Um, and then on Sunday, we will be uh, having the L.A. River Ride, the annual bike ride along the Los Angeles uh, River. And finally, on Sunday from 12 to 4, Atwater Street uh, Festival, the annual uh, street festival there on Glendale Boulevard, will be going throughout the afternoon, so please do join us. I can ask everybody to please rise for our journey motions. Mr. Alicone. Members, um, it gives me great sadness to uh, adjourn in the memory of a very good friend of mine, Ken Rowan. Uh, Ken Rowan was uh, an applicant's attorney, a workers' compensation attorney, a very prominent uh, former past president of the uh, California Applicants' Attorneys Association of the San Fernando Valley. Uh, and uh, he passed away uh, due to uh, uh, cancer of the esophagus. Uh, very suddenly, uh, essentially, uh, he was diagnosed in January. Uh, and I just saw him uh, around that time, and he was very vibrant at the time, so I was very shocked, as, as many were, uh, when he passed. Um, Ken uh, really was a champion for working people uh, as they struggle with injuries. He, in fact, 
defined new law relative to uh, the determination of what pain is uh, and is very respected in, in his community for uh, that uh, accomplishment. But he is truly a Renaissance man, a world traveler. Uh, he had investments all over the world, a very huge giver, uh, uh, primarily in the Jewish community, but in, in throughout uh, gave to numerous uh, foundations. Uh, the family asked that uh, any contributions in his name be uh, dedicated to a uh, newly established Kenro and Endowment Fund at the Los Angeles Hebrew High School Academy, where he was just honored for lifetime achievement, as well as uh, he was a, a Trojan, and so uh, he asked that, uh, uh, that uh, donations be given uh, at uh, USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, he leaves uh, his wife Susie, his children Michael, Alyssa, and Daniel, and his grandchildren, Arajwan and Holden. Thank you, Mr. Alakon. Mr. Labange. Thank you, I ask we all the Jordan memory of Rochelle North, the wife of John North of KABC Television, who we all know. His wife was battling breast cancer, and last Saturday uh, she uh, collapsed and passed away. Uh, she encouraged John to take a little ride to get out on a uh, on, on, a, on his motorcycle and enjoy it. When he came back, pulled on his street, there were the paramedics there, and she had pronounced uh, dead. But I ask we all adjourn in his memory. Personally, he was uh, very good to me uh, last year in coaching me a little in my own family, my own Bridget's Challenge, which she beat. But uh, Rochelle North, the wife of John North of KABC Television. We'll put adjourn. all members on that. Thank you. And then also, members, I ask we adjourn in memory. Uh, of Irving Ziegler, a former uh, commissioner with Mayor Bradley, the Recreation and Parks Commission, a uh, great guy who uh, uh, also was a great Dodger fan, and for 43 years it was a famous little story in the paper. He uh, uh, always had the, the great seats on the field level there. Irv Ziegler was 89 years old. He survived by his wife Beatrice, his son David, and daughters Lenny and Susie. Irving Ziegler, a great former commissioner under Mayor Bradley. Thank you. Mr. Parks. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd ask that we adjourn in memory of uh, really a civil rights giant, uh, former Maryland Representative Perrin Mitchell, uh, who was actually the founding member of the Congressional Black Caucus. He died uh, just recently of 85. Uh, he was a uh, Democratic elected to the House of Representatives from Baltimore. He was the first black uh, to ever represent uh, Maryland at that level, uh, and that was in 1907. 70. Uh, he served eight terms. He stepped down in, in 1986 as he ran for uh, lieutenant governor in uh, a bid for uh, that office. Uh, he also was a member of uh, uh, what was commonly referred to as the uh, Black Kennedy family because he and his family had made such an impact on civil rights nationally and particularly in the uh, Maryland area. His brother Clarence helped shepherd uh, major civil rights legislation in the late 50s and 60s as the principal lobbyist for the NAACP. Uh, his sister-in-law was also a uh, uh, Juanita Jackson Mitchell, was a longtime head of the legal counsel for the Maryland chapter of the NAACP. Uh, the current mayor, uh, O'Malley, says that uh, he was a transitional leader and a source of great inspiration. Uh, he was born in uh, Baltimore in 1922. Uh, he served as a commissioned officer in the Army during World War II and also received the Purple Heart. He received his bachelor's degree in 1950 from Morgan State. What's interesting about his accomplishment at Morgan State is that the college president uh, turned him down saying it was inadvisable for blacks to attend College Park. Instead, they set up a separate graduate program for off-campus study, which was established specifically for him in Baltimore. He sued them and prevailed, becoming the first black person to enroll in, grad, uh, in graduate uh, classes at College Park. Uh, in Congress, he also had landmark legislation that he fought for requiring local governments to set aside 10 percent federal grants to hire minority contractors. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers him, but he was a, a real a giant uh, in his day and just unfortunately uh, passed away after a long illness. Uh, uh, in uh, in Maryland. Thank you. All members on that. Mr. Zine. Mr. Wesson. Sorry. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. President and, and members. I, I rise today to adjourn in the memory of uh, Raymond Washington. Uh, he deserves for me to say more than I am able to say, but um, I just want to say, you know, I'll see you later, Uncle Raymond. Thank you, Mr. Wesson, and Mr. Design is next. Uh, Gene Rosen passed away on June 5th, born April 4th, 1918, Revere, Massachusetts. Came to California in 1955, lived in various parts of San Fernando Valley before settling in Tarzana. Married her husband, Martin, in 1940. They married for 67 years. Was sensitive, warm, a generous and loving person. Executive Secretary for Lockheed International was a wonderful person who will be greatly missed by her family and friends. Uh, sad that her husband passed away last month. Uh, survived by sons Keith, who's a personal, very dear friend, also a member of the LAPD band, Keith Rosen, and uh, son Lauren, granddaughter Judy, a grandson Steve, and four great grandsons, Brandon, Jordan, William, and Marcus. May Jean Rosen rest in peace. Thank you, Mr. Zine. And I, I joined today with uh, Mr. Uh, Reyes. I'm sure Mr. Wiesar would um, like to be a part of this as well to adjourn in uh, memory of Joan Lundy, um, a great activist in Glassell Park area who passed away um, last night um, with her family at her bedside. Uh, her husband, Bill, and she uh, fought for school desegregation in the 1960s. Sorry, the 19, uh, yeah, 1960s. She also worked and enacted incredible positive change throughout the Glassell Park community, uh, spearheading efforts such as the picnic area, the swimming pool, the child care center, remodeling the gymnasium, and the former seniors' room. She was al she always challenged, cajoled, partnered with the city to help accomplish her goals for her neighborhood. Those of us who remember her, uh, she always used uh, humor. And, uh, uh, but an, an iron uh, fist behind the, the jokes and she demanded the very best for her community and indeed she got it. She is really beloved in the community. Um, she had a, a series of strokes this year, a serious one uh, that happened over the weekend and uh, she succumbed to um, the injuries from that last night um, and I know that she now lives in CD13, sorry 14, it used to be part of CD13 but Mr. Reyes knew, knew her very well as well. So Mr. Reyes. I wanted to uh, just rise and give my sympathies to the, to the family. Um, Joan Lundy was, uh, I met her in the early 90s uh, during the Taylor Yard community meetings. And many of the scenarios you see evolving in the Northeast, especially in Cypress Park and Glassell Park, were from her advocacy along with a whole group of, of leaders that are now enjoying their golden years and are in their twilight years. And uh, Joan talked about the issues of what happens to our kids, what happens to our seniors. Uh, she helped plant a row of trees along South Florida Road. And she kept telling me, why do they keep treating our neighborhoods like the old industrial yards of the 20s and 30s? It's now the 80s and 90s. We should be talking about how we make our lives that much more richer. But uh, as Councilperson has said, uh, she did, uh, I remember experiences of her raking me through the coals several times, but it was because she was so passionate about the kinds of changes she wanted to see. So my prayers are with, with her and her family, Bill, and uh, God bless her. Yes. God bless Joan Lundy. Thank you. Mr. Lesson. My Absolutely. we we'll all members to Mr. Wessons. And with that, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. We'll next be in session on Tuesday, that is June 12th, uh, 10 a.m. here in Council Chambers. Uh, thank you all.